Lepo pozdravljeni in dobrodošli na današnji razdelovnici in prezentaciji praksi in izkustva vezanih na multikulturnost v visokom obrazovanju. So, uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the workshop Intercultural, Intercultural, oh, sorry, Interculturality in Higher Education. Uh, we agreed that we will record today's presentation and we will also share with you recording and workshop uh, materials. So today's workshop is the sixth activity organized by the University of Ljubljana within this project. Uh, last February, we hosted Montenegro representatives at our university, where we presented our practices in the field of internationalization. Uh, then we also have different workshops uh, for strategy preparation, preparation of summer school courses uh, and courses in English. And last month we have a workshop teaching multicultural groups of students in higher education settings. So um, uh, I checked a list of um, participants and uh, we uh, already met with most of you. Uh, so uh, for the new one, I will just shortly briefly introduce us um, to the participants. My name is Katja Cerar. I'm responsible for the promotion and some support activities for candidates and students from abroad and also for collaboration uh, with international partners and within the networks so at the central level. And I'm also coordinating activities within this project. Um, with us is also Eva Rojans. Uh, she provides administrative and professional support within the project. And today is with us Dr. Špela Rasputnik, uh, an assistant professor of social pedagogy at the University of Ljubljana Faculty of Education. And uh, Dr. Rasputnik teaches several undergraduate and graduate courses, uh, theory and social inclusion, selected deviant phenomena, minorities, inequality and intercultural dialogue, responses to differences and the formation of identity. And third field of research are social inclusion and inclusion transition of youth to ad adulthood, dialogue, homelessness, interculturalism, vulnerability, cultural animation, life space orientation, and community work. So uh, internationalization is closely related uh, to intercultural dimensions and competencies. So Dr. Rasputnik lecture and workshop will focus on the condition and challenges that lie behind the implementation of internationalization and identification of differences of implementing the concept of interculturalism and uh, multiculturalism. So if you will have any question during the workshop uh, or comments, uh, please ask us or write us in the chat. Uh, and of course, you can always contact us after um, the presentation to our uh, email address. Uh, now I will give my word to Dr. Rasputnik. Uh, I think she will start with some introduction uh, process. Uh, yes, uh, Katya, thank you very much for introducing me and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, also very much looking forward to our workshop. Uh, I have to say that this is my uh, first international experience after maybe a year or even more. <laughs> so it's been a while uh, since I haven't been um, lecturing in English and so on. Uh, but I think that, um, yeah, I will, uh, uh, we will manage it together. Uh, so, um, uh, today we will have a workshop, uh, so lecture parts and um, important part of uh, our today's work will be also um, work in smaller groups or um, communication. Uh, so, I will need uh, your, um, uh, your cooperation. Uh, maybe, first of all, I would uh, like to share with you my presentation so that I will have um, 
structure. Uh -huh. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Uh, you will also uh, get this presentation and all the materials and handouts uh, that we will, we will be using um, after our workshop. Okay, so Katya already introduced me. So uh, she told you that I work on Faculty of Education, Department for Social Pedagogy. Uh, and I, my previous research is uh, connected with the topics that we will be dealing with today. So migration, uh, second generation immigrants, youth, gender, uh, in the migration experience, inclusion, limits of inclusion, also socioeconomic status in experience of migration and intersection, intersectionality. Uh, I also uh, conducted trainings on University of Ljubljana for staff in higher education. And this today is uh, my, first, um, uh, my first training uh, for a Montenegrin group. Uh, I would like to share a little bit uh, for the introduction about my uh, recent experience uh, with intercultural work uh, here in University of Ljubljana. Uh, so this is connected with uh, experience uh, of being mentor to some foreign students. Um, I've been mentoring foreign students uh, past 20 years actually. But this special experience is connected with a past month or past year, which was uh, for all of us a um, special year. Uh, so I am talking about um, the period of uh, lockdowns. And I would like to share with you uh, some phenomena, some new phenomena that I noticed um, in regard of experiences of foreign students I was in contact with. So uh, in this past year, uh, I noticed um, loneliness and isolation as something very strong and maybe more important than it was before. I also uh, noticed uh, they were struggling um, to meet all official and administrative demands, for example, uh, to get a permit card, find apartments, scholarship and so on. Uh, some of them were kind of caught in the country, for example, in Slovenia, because they were waiting for op official responses about their status. And on the other side, some of them uh, were being forced to leave the country because they couldn't stay here in this period. Uh, I also noticed uh, that they didn't have uh, anywhere to study during lockdown. For, for example, they were living in shared apartment and not having own place to study. Um, and also they were being far from their family or and partner for longer period of time. And uh, one thing that I also noticed uh, was very strong. They were dealing with uncertainty. What will happen today? What are my options? And uh, in some cases, I noticed that uh, their uh, visions were changing uh, actually every day from hour to hour. They uh, noticed uh, something new, they um, uh, realized that they have some obstacles and this uncertainty was uh, really big in this time. So I also wanted uh, for the introduction to share with you uh, some good practices that maybe helped me to deal with this um, these uh, experiences that students had. Uh, one of such practices is uh, psychosocial counseling for students uh, that is operating in different languages and is actually uh, started to operate within Faculty of Education. Uh, here is also the web page, so maybe later we can check. Uh, so this is one um, place or space where they can they can go and share their experience. Um, other things that uh, turned out as good practices were also um, engaging in different meaningful activities to fulfill this empty time, empty in, in a way. Um, also maybe volunteering or just um, uh, going for a walk, uh, for a coffee, just spending time together. 
Um, as a mentor, I was also supporting them in everyday challenges, for example, accompanying them to the offices, administrators, and so on. And very uh, important thing, organizing peer support, because peer support was not there. They were not uh, including, included in the group uh, physically at that time. And our task as mentors was also to organize kind of peer support around those students. Um, okay, this was just maybe um, introduction because I was thinking what was, um, what was going on in past year um, regarding um, foreign students in, in my environment here in Faculty of Education in Ljubljana. Uh, now I would like to briefly share plan for our work for today and for tomorrow and our main goals. So uh, we, we will discuss topics of interculturality in our plenum, so all together and also in smaller groups. Uh, I would like us to exchange views and experiences that we have. So I would also like uh, you to connect. Uh, some of you already shared uh, some experiences because you attended already uh, workshops and lectures. Um, and uh, some of you are probably maybe first time today on such uh, training. Um, I wish that we could have experiential learning process, uh, although we are uh, only on the computers, but I think that we can do some of this experiential learning. Uh, so my goal is that we can reflect upon our own images of minorities, of um, meeting different cultures and do process of sensibilization. Uh, I would also like to address uh, uh, institutions, uh, critically discuss institutionalized system and its elements that allow discrimination. And also, as I already said, getting to know participants and develop mutual communication to um, build the logical environment which allows participants participation and cooperation. Um, my first activity that I planned is actually a kind of introductional activity, but it's also already part of the process, uh, so part of the content, not only introduction. Uh, so uh, here I would invite uh, all of you, if uh, somebody could start and just briefly tell us uh, where are you coming from, maybe from which field or from which institution. And then uh, the other topic, uh, we would touch the topic of languages. So I would like, to, like you to share with us uh, to think about maybe when you are a child and, and youngster and so on, which languages uh, surrounded you in your life so far. Maybe you will think of some languages that you met and you've been in contact and we will see what, uh, what is this our field in which languages we somehow can communicate in the future also today. Uh, maybe just a little bit if you have something special about uh, expectations regarding uh, our workshop and then I would ask you to pick the next person after you, maybe just to say name. And uh, you can also pose one question to the other person, whatever you would like to know, maybe, uh, I, I don't know, uh, favorite uh, movie or whatever. And uh, the other person can then decide whether to answer or not. And uh, when we will also hear um, these uh, also languages that you you are surrounded with and you communicate in then maybe we can also decide how to communicate today uh, because i heard from katya that uh, usually uh, lectures are in english but then discussions are in montenegrin language so maybe we can decide after this first introduction uh, how will be uh, the best to communicate today so for everybody's um, um, maybe easy to share. So maybe I will, uh, I hope uh, you remember this question so I can stop sharing just for this part. And I would uh, ask uh, somebody um, if you can please start. 
I can start. Hello to everybody. My name is Svetlana Kalizic Radanić. I come from University of Montenegro and uh, I teach uh, literature for children and youth. So this is actually my basic uh, field of research, but also I like to spread my knowledge in very various directions. And this is among others, uh, the reason why I'm here today. Uh, regarding my childhood, I was surrounded mostly by my own language, Montenegrin, in my childhood, but I also was, um, I was exposed to pieces of other languages, mainly English and French. So um, those were perhaps words I heard in my childhood, but I can't say that I spoke any foreign language when I was a child or that I was exposed, exposed to any foreign language in, you know, let's say, um, in, in majority of my time as, as a child. Uh, from today's uh, workshop, I expect to spread my knowledge about interculturality because at my university, uh, until now, I had only three or four foreign students. Uh, some of them were from Bulgaria, uh, so one was from Poland, and uh, I think that uh, one girl was from Slovenia. So I don't consider Slovenia as, uh, as a different country. It's, it's basically the same cultural space. Also, I could say for Bulgaria and Poland, because it's Slavic space. But still, I really would like to to to, to spread my uh, to share uh, no to yes to 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 improve my knowledge about all these things because my experiences with foreign students were amazing, but they we were mostly communicating in Montenegro language because they were studying Montenegro language. So basically, I had opportunity to spoke with foreign students on foreign languages only when I go abroad when I give Erasmus lectures or something like that. So I really would like to, to, to know more about the, this, these things. This is actually the reason why I'm here today. Thank you, Svetlana. Uh, could you please uh, pick uh, another person? Uh, uh, the next one. Okay. Um, I hear, see, uh, I can see that there is, there is only one uh, male here, perhaps uh, Abhishek would like to, to uh, say something about himself. Oh yeah, sure ma'am. Uh, can you hear me ma'am? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, this is Abhishek Pandey. Uh, I am a PhD research scholar at SESPV MB University Kanchipuram in, uh, in Southern India. And uh, uh, I can, uh, uh, from childhood onwards, uh, I am in, uh, I can understand that languages, uh, Hindi, English, uh, Hindi is my mother tongue. And uh, since I'm uh, doing my PhD in Southern part of India, therefore uh, I can understand and uh, I can write uh, even Tamil also. And uh, this is my first uh, webinar with your university. And uh, why I am here uh, is uh, uh, what my expectation from this webinar is to to broaden my understanding the interculturality uh, in in uh, in higher education. Uh, once again, I would like to thank organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to be part of uh, this uh, this conference. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Abhishek. Maybe you could uh, pick uh, next person, please. Uh, Madam Anna, mm -hmm. can you please unmute yourself and... <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Anna Maximovic and I'm coming from University of Donia Gorica, exactly from Faculty of Applied uh, Science and Study Program Applied uh, Psychology. Um, when I was little, I uh, was surrounded by two languages. One is uh, my own Montenegrin, and the second one was Russian because my mother is from Russia. Uh, on this study program, uh, we don't have foreign uh, students. Um, uh, 
uh, but next we and uh, but next study year we are expecting one uh, from Ukraine, so we are excited. Um, these workshops, because I was particip uh, participating um, in the previous, were useful for me because I don't have much experience in this topic. Topics because I'm uh, young and I'm just uh, starting teaching. So thank you everyone on this workshop. That's it. Thank you, Anna. Okay, we have uh, more than one Anna with us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Anna, you can you can pick uh, the next one, please. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, please uh, unmute yourself or. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I will pick um, Senka. Senka, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, thank you, Anna, very much for choosing myself. My name is Senka. I am from Maritime Faculty Kotor. Um, and um, related to my childhood, I can say that um, it is not a big difference in languages, but uh, I used to live in Serbia in my early childhood, and it is not a big language difference. Actually, it was former Yugoslavia, but um, I have to admit that a different environment uh, and different language, slightly different, helped me uh, much in my later years because I became more flexible, more adaptable, and uh, nowadays uh, I have to admit that it is not difficult uh, for me to change uh, places, to change schools, to teach different students, and uh, it is such a big advantage to have different environment while uh, uh, your uh, childhood uh, and uh, also schooling in that early years. Uh, today, um, I am a co-mentor of many students that uh, come abroad. Um, due to this COVID situation, I had students from Croatia and I uh, uh, do um, as a co-mentor on their master thesis. Um, as Montenegro is also a maritime country as Croatia, we uh, made an integrated approach to sustainable development of Croatia ports and marinas. So it was a um, very uh, nice experience for me uh, to um, communicate with the students uh, from University of Split and to be their support in writing and defending their master thesis. Thank you, Sinka. You're welcome. Uh, now I am supposed to pick uh, uh, some persons. Uh, okay, I will choose one that uh, has their, uh, that have their cameras uh, uh, switch on. Uh, let's say Miss Radenka Krsmanovic. Okay, thank you, Sanka. So uh, I'm working uh, at the University of Donia Goritz at the Faculty of Applied Sciences. I started recently in uh, January and uh, I'm teaching uh, bits of physics uh, to the students of so the first and the fourth year. So um, uh, I have, so far I worked uh, uh, in research. So I'm a physicist and material sciences and uh, I uh, spent uh, over 10 years, uh, no, actually I spent 20 years abroad. I was not in Montenegro, but, and, but uh, uh, half of that time I spent in uh, uh, Italy, Belgium, France, Portugal, and half of that time I was working at the Vinci Institute of Nuclear Sciences in Belgrade. Um, I, uh, so I spent my master uh, and my P I did my master and my PhD uh, abroad in Italy and Belgium, and I can say I, I have this uh, intercultural experience. Um, and um, uh, I'm married to to a British person, so the language I hear every day is English, and I'm 
speaking Montenegrin and English at home. Uh, uh, and in my childhood, yes, I was speaking only Montenegrin and, of course, English at school. Uh, uh, so that's it. I think that that uh, what uh, Senk mentioned it about the adaptability, it's true. I think moving around, uh, meeting new people, their, uh, their cultures, you know, we become more adaptable to changes, more resilient. And also, I think this is the case with COVID, for example, uh, that, that was a test for the resilience, probably. Um, last year, so last uh, when, the, when COVID started, I was in Italy and I spent the first uh, six months of COVID there. So it was tough, but uh, it was working from home, having children at home. It was really tough. And uh, uh, that was also the reason why, why we decided to go back to Montenegro. Um, so that, that's it. Um, uh, I, uh, what I uh, want from this workshop, I would like to see what's the... Um, what's the situation in Montenegro actually because I was not here for a long time so I would like to see um, I don't know how many international students we have here and I never met anyone uh, so uh, I will choose now uh, I think Anna Nikolic can you, can hear, you me? hear me Can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Anna Nikolic. I come from Montenegro and I am finishing a fifth year of school um, academic of knowledge uh, college from Budva and I'm currently working in Mediterranean University in Podgorica. Um, I come from Budva that is a small tourist place and languages are main priority for me. Uh, I always speak uh, languages because um, that is the main reason for we earn money uh, with languages. We meet a lot of people and we work and everything is about languages. Um, for uh, one year, uh, I lived in India and I was traveling um, a lot uh, to a lot of different countries. So I know English, Italian, uh, I know Sanskrit, uh, Indian uh, language, and I'm. Uh, languages are something that I love and something that I am used to, and I teach my daughter to speak English like a main language besides of Montenegrin, and I think that um, in the time of pandemic, um, languages are something that we used to earn money, to communicate with people, to communicate with a lot of uh, people that are not here because we were separated and uh, everyone come and everyone goes and everyone needs to go back to their country because of pandemic and it, it isn't over and in Montenegro we don't know when it will finish so I think that's it and I just need to say that uh, I'm I'm really um, I'm loving this that you organized this topic this workshop um, I'm interested in and I'm all ears so uh, you have my my support in everything that you do. Thank you so much. And now maybe Biljana Stepanovic. Hello, everyone. Hi, Anna, and uh, thank you, Anna, for choosing me. Um, I apologize to everybody because my camera is off. It simply doesn't work. There is there is no chance to turn it on. 
So that's why you can see only my photo now. Um, I'm an associate professor at the Faculty of Civil Engineering at the University of Montenegro. I'm from Montenegro, from Podgorica, and during my childhood and uh, teenage period, I wasn't exposed uh, to any other language except uh, Montenegrin and Serbo-Croatian language that was spoken in uh, ex-Yugoslavia. But later on, during my university education, actually during my postgraduate university education, I was exposed to different languages because I spent uh, different parts of my education in different countries. So I was exposed to, to English, to German, to Spanish, to Czech language, to Slovak language, to Bulgarian language. To, for a couple of months or even for a couple of years, I was exposed to different languages. And um, uh, actually, I speak fluently only English, but uh, I can also use German and uh, Spanish language for, for some let's say personal use, not for uh, profession, not as a professional language. Um, why I'm here? Because I would like just to share experience, to learn from the experience of uh, other persons in the domain of uh, interculturality. Um, I, I can say for myself that I enjoy traveling and that I enjoy meeting uh, and um, getting to know more about the different cultures uh, in different aspects of meaning of uh, bird culture. So I would really like to know more about experiences of uh, colleagues from other faculties of my university, of other universities, of other countries. And that's why um, I'm glad to be here today. Now I would like to call to call Isidora Lakic. Thank you, Professor Biljana. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad that I'm here today uh, with all of you. I'm uh, Isidora Lakic and I'm coming from University of Montenegro and I work in the uh, International Relations Office at the, uh, as the administrative uh, staff. And I'm also dealing with the um, Erasmus Plus program, mobility program. Uh, during my childhood, as Professor Biljana uh, uh, already uh, explained, I was uh, uh, surrounded by former Yugoslavian language, of course, um, with Montenegrin and Serb Croatian as uh, mother language. Uh, also, uh, from my uh, kindergarten, as I can say, uh, I was uh, surrounded with English language and also I uh, have started uh, learning Russian language from my elementary school. Uh, also, uh, as, um, uh, as I spent, since I spent uh, part of my master studies in Portugal, I uh, started learning uh, Portuguese language. So I hope that I have, I will have time to continue uh, because I fell in love with that language. Uh, I uh, don't expect anything specific uh, from this uh, workshop, only to share experiences with you and also to, to uh, gain some new experiences. Uh, uh, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Now I will choose, um, let's say, uh, Jovana Popovic to, to share her uh, experience and opinion with us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Just a minute, sorry. Uh, my name is uh, Jovana Popovic and I'm coming from University of Vanya Gorica. Currently, I'm an intern at university, so I work with my colleagues in admi administrative staff for students. And I can say that, um, and also I'm a master student of entrepreneurial economy 
international main subject international economy i can say that on the university of donia gorica our official language is besides montenegrin english also so we have a lot of foreign students and uh, we on daily basis we communicate on english and we can say that english is also very popular and common on our university on everyday basis and uh, i can say that uh, on my personal experience uh, i will next year spend on in portugal so i will speak i guess with Port portuguese and english language too that's it and uh, now i will pick i don't know maybe uh Miss Senka Shukvarat, I guess. Okay, thank you. I already spoke, but anyhow, I maybe missed the opportunity to say what is my motive for today being. My motive for today being is to just uh, discover how I can improve my work, uh, having in mind that uh, sharing experiences in discussion, uh, may give me a new ideas to be better to my students and to new customers of my service in international relation office at the maritime faculty quarter. I now choose um, uh, Miss Maya Yunshai, let's say. Okay. Then, Kakli uh, uh, Rezelberg, Kakli, Miss or Mr. Miss, yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Hakila Rezelbegovic. It's, it's hard to pronounce my name, but <laughs> some people get used to it or use uh, my surname or short name, that nickname. Uh, I'm coming from University of Donia Gorica. Currently, I'm on the f fifth year of uh, Masters, Europe European Masters in Official Statistics. When I was little, I was surrounded by two languages, Albanian, which is my, uh, my native language, and, uh, and Montenegro, uh, when I started studying in Podgorica. My expectations regarding to this uh, workshops are to understand interculturality, culturality in in higher education, and to know new people. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe because I think that only the person with the name Pripravnik didn't speak up. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Hakile, maybe Radislav? Or Radislav. Or um, Radislav Jovovic. Or Lydia, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Lydia also. Uh, Lydia Lukovic, is she here? Uh, yeah. Maybe they are not here or... Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, anyone who hasn't uh, spoken yet, uh, if you are with us, can you please? Uh, maybe they are not here at the moment. Okay, so, uh, or no, no, they are not. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, for sharing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we noticed that we are actually very uh, multi, a lingual group and like ve very, very rich in this regard. Um, so maybe now we can also discuss a little, ah, aha, uh -huh. Maya. Okay, Maya. Hello. Yes, yes. How are you? Fine, thank you. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Maya Yunchai and I'm uh, an associate at the University of Donia Gorica. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we were just, uh, yeah, I was just discussing uh, about uh, languages that we are using and uh, now maybe we could also um, 
make a decision uh, how we will communicate today. Uh, so, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, ev for everyone, English is okay, and uh, maybe Montenegrin is not uh, okay for everyone. Abhishek, probably you don't understand Montenegrin, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I think uh, we can communicate in English, and if we are in smaller groups, and if maybe someone feels more comfortable to speak in Montenegrin, I think it's also okay, uh, because I heard in previous um, previous trainings uh, in discussion you maybe used Montenegrin or English, but for now let's stick with with English so everyone can understand. Um, Okay, so um, for for the the next part, we would do uh, one activity in smaller groups, and after this activity, we would have um, a part uh, when where I would where I would introduce a few more theoretical insights. Uh, but now I will share again. Uh -huh, just a second. Uh -huh. I will just share again my presentation. Sorry. Okay. Uh, can you see the presentation? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, in the next part, which will take 15, maybe 20 minutes, um, we would do one activity, uh, which I named, guess who is coming to our department. Uh, maybe you already know this this activity or maybe you did it in another context but today i put it in the context of our topic so um we will um we will form four groups uh, i suggest that i randomly form those groups so we will go in breakout rooms in four uh, and uh, here are instructions for you uh please um your your uh uh, your task will be to make up the story, to make it up spontaneously, so without thinking too much, uh, by each of the members adding one sentence. So I will give you the first sentence. Uh, I will go in each group and I will give you the first sentence, so the introduction in the chat, and then I will ask you just to continue. And the best way to continue the story or to make up this story is maybe that each member just adds one sentence. And uh, we will be making a story about one person coming to your department, so fictional department. You can imagine, I don't know, one of your departments or your university or just a fictional one. So a person is coming, it can be a student or it can be a professor, researcher. And uh, you would just try to think uh, who is this person that is coming, uh, what is her or his motivation, um, is he or she coming alone? And then the next part, uh, what do we need to think of providing for him or her on our university or in our community? Uh, then I would also ask you to write down this story. So if one person could maybe write down and report. So when we come back in our bigger group, I would ask each group to report, uh, to read us this story. Uh, was that clear? Okay. Uh, so now I will make four groups. And then uh, I will leave this first line of the story in each group, and then you can start. And after I think that 20 minutes will be enough, I would just uh, call... Uh, uh, first sentence was...
teacher professor Daniel from United States, California is invited as a guest to University of Montenegro and he's coming this September. He finished molecular biology on California University and now he works as an expert on the field of um, the medical system, system in Montenegro. His main goal is, is to support young researchers in discovering new uh, methods in prevention of anomalies in genetics. He's coming with his partner and they are middle-aged couple. They are looking for accommodation near university. They have strong interests in hiking and fishing. So colleagues from uh, university have um, invited him to join them on the cocktail. They organized uh, for all department mem members so they can introduce uh, themselves. Um, also, um, they organized him a, uh, a short course of Montenegrin language and a short trips and daily excursions from, uh, for visiting different parts of Montenegro. Uh, all, so, uh, as a colleagues, we provided him uh, different activities and we accommodated um, him in uh, the laboratory office. Uh, also, um, one pro pro professor from the university invited him on uh, Slava to enjoy in, in our traditional way of celebrating uh, our family day. That's it. Okay. <laughs> voilà, Anna. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, I suggest that we uh, hear uh, all the stories and then have a discussion. Okay. okay. So I would ask the next group. Yeah. Okay. I think we are. We were the third group. So we we uh, imagine this uh, this. Uh, um, story differently, let's say. So we were, three of us, we were sitting in the office at the university and then uh, the secretary came and said, teacher, Professor Amina from Eastern Turkey is coming next week to our university. And so we started the discussion. We said, uh, uh, okay, uh, when is she come go next week? Uh, what, what's, what is she, what is she will be doing? Uh, do we have uh, her surname? So, uh, uh, how old is she? Let's check her on the LinkedIn. That was something like, let's see what is she doing, because we don't have anything. Uh, does she have a family? How long is she staying? Does she need a flat? Anna was very helpful because she is in uh, uh, this... Uh, uh, business uh, renting uh, par apartments in, uh, um, in in Montenegro, and then she said, "I can, I can. If she, if we write her a letter and ask her what she needs, I can already prepare a list for her, so she will uh, she will have a list of possible. But we actually don't know uh, how long is she uh, how long uh, is she staying? Is she staying for a semester or just a short uh, visit? So." These were the questions. Uh, okay, yeah, but we uh, we agreed we will ask uh, uh, we will ask the secretary for more information. Then she will we will write her a letter to welcome her. She will be in our office. That's the only thing we know, and uh, we will looking how to arrange the office, which desk to give to her, and. Um, uh, except uh, Abu Hishek wanted to uh, wanted to know which uh, food does she like because that's important. And uh, uh, I was we were thinking also because she's from Eastern Turkey, it will be uh, there will be no problem with food in Montenegro, but better to check. And uh, and we wanted to invite her to a welcome dinner when she arrived. That's uh, that's something. <laughs> that's all I think. 
Rahvala Rabinka. Thank you. Uh, and we have uh, okay. one more group. Fourth group, yes. Our assignment was uh, to uh, imagine the story about student Riku from uh, Finland. Um, he's a student of tourism from Finland who is coming to Montenegro because he saw uh, Montenegro at one um, uh, tourism fair. Uh, so he wanted to visit our country because he considers us as very uh, interesting touristic destination. But there is also one private reason why, why he picked Montenegro to come for a student exchange, because his mother is from Montenegro, so he kind of uh, understands Montenegro language, but he is not able to speak it uh, fluently. Uh, that was the reason why we wanted to host him uh, at one typical Montenegrin family. So he, we didn't rent him apartment uh, uh, somewhere, but uh, in, a, in the house, he had apartment in the house uh, where it was typical Montenegrin family because we wanted him to know the country from inside. So that was, uh, let's say, one, um, one goal of our intention to, to uh, find him apartment within Montenegrin family. Um, he, um, we also wanted to welcome him uh, by um, taking him to different places, uh, which were very interesting and very beautiful from Scudder Lake to Montenegrin coast. But uh, that's also something that uh, it's going to be interesting for him professionally uh, because he's a student of uh, tourism. Um, uh, when we were contact, uh, contacting him for the first time, for a certain period of time, let's say half an hour, he was kind of distance, distanced, he was kind of a little bit emotionally cold, but after that, when he opened up himself, he was very, very warm and very, um, very, let's say, although he's from Finland, he was kind of Mediterranean type of person. Uh, very open, very, very warm. Uh, his uh, stay in Montenegro, we uh, used for, we wanted to use uh, for some other purposes. We wanted to see how Finland and Montenegro could be connected, although he's a student, perhaps he could have some interesting ideas. Uh, and also we wanted to um, know something uh, more uh, because Finland is considered as one of the happiest world countries because there is this index of uh, happiness which can be measured. And also Finland is known as a country with the, the very best education because they don't, uh, they don't put knowledge in uh, drawers like we do. They kind of uh, uh, connect different areas and different uh, fields, which is very, very productive especially in the field of education. So we also, although he came to Montenegro, we also used every opportunity to know more about Finland because we consider that uh, cultural exchange and exchange of ideas and uh, let's say uh, patterns that we, uh, the cultural patterns that we, that we have in our own countries was uh, something very, very useful. Perhaps we couldn't change the system, but perhaps we could find some interesting ideas that in the future could be implemented. Uh, voila, Svetlana, thank you very much, Svetlana. So uh, now we've heard uh, all three stories. Uh, and uh, yeah, they were quite different. Of course, this process making of them was also a little bit different. Uh, you had different approaches. And uh, now, I, I, now I would like to uh, invite you to reflect a little bit upon this process of story making, maybe to share a little bit, was it uh, difficult? Was it easy? Um, what was those expectations from certain country, which was the only information that you had and the name and maybe gender, how it shaped your story. 
uh, maybe we could say something about uh, the background of our beliefs that showed through the story. Where are they from? Or maybe some differences between the story that you noticed and were um, meaningful? Well, I can say that uh, I, I don't uh, think that um, imagining the story about a student from Finland was particularly difficult because uh, all three of us in groups, or at least two of us, had uh, some experiences with uh, Scandinavian people or people from Finland. Uh, I have very good friends from Finland, so I kind of could incorporate my own experience in inventing the story, but still I would say that my own experiences actually shaped the story uh, in pretty, pretty, pretty big measure. Uh, mm -hmm. I I noticed the differences in in other stories, uh, but I I'm not sure that I can explain them. Perhaps it seems that all of us uh, we already put in the story in advance our previous knowledge about country or a cultural context or something like that. So there is a term in uh, Montenegrin language, we call it um, kulturno upisivanje, kad vi unaprijed upisujete neki, neki, um, neki šablon koji imate o zemlji u uh, ono čemu ćete pričati. So I think that, that this happened here. I, Perhaps others would uh, have some other explanation. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Svetlana Mogus, uh, can I only ask uh, kulturno opisivanje? Upisivanje. Uh, upisivanje. Da upisujete. Znači Aha. da unaprijed upisujete u svoj tekst nešto što već imate kao prethodno iskustvo. To je izraz. Vrlo ga je teško prevesti, tako da... Ne znam, ne znam kako bi ga prevela na engleski. I to nije, to, nisu, to nije isti izraz ko predrasuda. Ne. No, ne. ne. To su ne. kao kulturne, cultural enrollment, tako mm -hmm. nešto mm -hmm. može da se... It can be described as... Okay. Mm -hmm. Dakle, to nije predrasuda, to su iskustva koja već imate. Dakle, to nije nešto čemu vi, um, kako da kažem, it's not something that you... It's not prejudice. It's not something that you uh, don't experience, so you have some sort of opinion, although you didn't have experience. This is something that you had experience about. So according to that experience in the past, part of that experience you put in making up the story about that cultural context. Mm -hmm. Voilà. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can um, we can draw a line like uh, and say okay this is kulturno uh, opisivanje um, and on the other side prejudice you think these processes are divided or so, maybe I think so because prejudice is, prejudice has negative connotation when you have prejudice it's always negative but when you say kulturno upisivanje that when you uh, when you enroll some of your previous experiences in making up the story, it doesn't have to be negatively connotated. So uh, I think that there is difference in in um, in this u tom predznaku da li je da li je taj predznak pozitivan ili negativan. Can I go now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, hi again. Um, I would definitely agree with the previous story and I would just, um, I need to say that uh, I would uh, give a name to this, like cultural imprinting. We all have uh, every culture printed in ourselves and I think that um, for example, in my story, Professor Amira uh, maybe uh, has some prejudice. Uh, it's okay. Every single uh, person, when it's leaving his or her country and going to another one, uh, has prejudice. Like, for, exam for example, I, um, I am in tourism all my life and every single one uh, of my tourists has 
uh, prejudice because Montenegro is like has some some story uh, like a small country we we aren't um, like others uh, in tourism we are um, every single one told me a story like a prejudice but uh, it's my uh, priority and it's my responsibility to um, to take out the prejudice and imprint the best of my culture to Professor Amira. So um, we, um, I, I came up with uh, this story. Uh, I wanted to, to say to Professor Amira, okay, I will give you an apartment. I will give you to uh, eat uh, dinner uh, because um, Turkish, uh, culture is very similar to Montenegrin. I will give you everything and then we will meet uh, maybe early lunch, maybe dinner, maybe uh, maybe breakfast. Uh, I need to meet you. I need to uh, so, uh, I need to hear from you. I need to know more about you uh, because I don't uh, have every information uh, from LinkedIn or welcome letter that I need. So uh, I would definitely, uh, that is the, the something that with it, I will be finishing my, my comment. Uh, it's my main responsibility to uh, imprint in Amira my culture, my country and to present Amira, my university, my work as uh, the best possible university in the world and to make her feel like she's home. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Anna. Uh, yes, and uh, if I understood you correctly, you would put a uh, your person into it and also you as a representative or of your institution and also representative of the country. So on more levels, uh, this imprinting would take part. Uh, I would uh, have a comment um, when uh, Svetlana, you are mentioning this negative connotation with prejudice. And I wanted just to shortly uh, to share one story that one preschool teacher, uh, shared with me. Uh, she was like very enthusiastic preschool teacher, so working in kindergarten, like very uh, competent, uh, very much into intercultural education. And um, uh, she, she got information that a child from one African country is coming into their kindergarten. So like we did this exercise now, she's coming. I only have her name, but I don't know anything. And she wanted really to prepare herself. And like she had these uh, ideas, oh, maybe they don't have uh, enough money. They are poor family. Maybe it would be good if I collect clothes and toys and so on for her so that she would really feel uh, welcome. And then this family came and they, they were like well-situated family, um, not poor at all. So this was maybe this moment when she realized that her previous ideas uh, were based on, yeah, some stereotypes about country that we don't know really well, or we think we know, or maybe we have some experience, but we don't know what will be this experience like. So, exactly. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, because when we have experience, then we are able to uh, to deal with our prejudice and to resolve them, to to uh, to um, to deal with them in a way that they don't have uh, they they don't have power in our uh, in our patterns of thinking about somebody. It's it's actually about dissolving the patterns. So we don't think about people; we think of them about persons, not about patterns that should be uh, uh, representing a specific culture or something like that. I have a very similar story. For example, uh, when my husband was a child, he was living in, um, in uh, Cambridge for a couple of years. So when he came there, uh, first uh, one of the first questions they asked him was, uh, do you live in houses? 
do you in Montenegro live in houses? And he was like, of course we do. Because in, uh, in, um, in the conscience or in the mind of, of British people, these, uh, let's say, 80s, uh, early, uh, not early 80s, early 90s, uh, re representation of Montenegro, where was the war at the time, was like that we don't have anything that we perhaps live in fields or something like that. So it was kind of uh, very interesting the way what we think about other cultures and what other cultures think uh, about us. So it's it's always actually about dissolving patterns and seeing in the person the person. And I actually, uh, even in, in my classes and in, in my life, I'm always for uh, those categories which, has, which are above national context. So I really, I truly do believe in universality of human nature. I truly do. Uh, thank you very much, Setlana. Uh, when, when you mentioned this uh, experience of your husband, uh, I thought of one story. Actually, I was thinking maybe also to including it uh, into our, um, our training, but I will probably just uh, give you a link. It's um, um, a Nigerian writer. Uh, her name is uh, Shimamanda Ngozi Adishie. I'm not sure if you've heard about her or not, but there is a TED talk uh, which, uh, which is titled um, The Danger of a Single Story. And uh, I, I will give you uh, the link in the chat later in the break, uh, because it's, yeah, it's uh, about this, what we are talking uh, about right now. Uh, her experience is being a woman from Nigeria, moving to United States, studying, facing um, these ideas of Oh, you are speaking English. How come? What kind of music do you are you listening? You know, this one single idea of African woman uh, from her close friends, from her roommates, from her teachers in the university, or for example, when she was a writer and then her story uh, and uh, her, her university teacher asked her, Oh, it's really good, but could it be a little bit more African? It's not enough, you know, of this, what we, um, we suppose of as African, as different. So this was just my, um, now my idea. And yeah, I will share with you. And maybe if you have a chance to take a look, maybe we can discuss about it a little bit tomorrow. Um, now I would like to ask you if maybe uh, anyone else would like to add something um, on this part about stories, anything else that needs to be uh, said? Um, if not, uh, then I would like to uh, share with you another part um, and maybe for another 15 or 20 minutes. And then uh, I would uh, suggest that we make a break. And then after break, um, I prepared more um, some concepts, more theoretical concepts that we would include in this, what we are talking about now. And I will present something and hopefully we will discuss further. Is it okay like this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will... Um, share. Uh -huh. Okay, I hope you can see. So this was the discussion, you can see the presentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here, um, out of this exercise, different things are coming out. Each time I do this exercise, something, something different is uh, coming out from, from different groups. Uh, but usually we, we can see um, that um, unequal appreciation of unequal ideas of different countries and cultures are somehow showing when we are doing these exercises. And of course, this discussion, what is it based upon? Um, why do we orient towards different countries, uh, different, um, also different um, yeah, like different cultures in different ways. Uh, maybe another story that I hear a lot here in Slovenia, and maybe it will have something to do with you, or maybe it's completely different from your experience. 
um, in um, in education in Slovenia, uh, children learn English language besides Slovenian, and also few other languages are offered. For example, as um, German language or Italian language, um, especially in the coastal part. And of course, those those languages are very appreciated and. Uh, now children are learning those languages even in preschool period already. Um, but we have many more languages in our schools. Uh, for example, Albanian language from people that move from Kosovo or from also Macedonia or many languages from former Yugoslavia as also more, maybe Montenegrin, Bosnian, uh, Serbian, Croatian and so on. And those languages are somehow not so appreciated in our educational system and they don't have uh, such place or they are not uh, learned as a subject, although more people are talking those languages. And um, for example, if family uh, speaks uh, English at home, then it's really appreciated if a child would uh, share, for example, when we read books, uh, how do you call it, and then you you tell the content of the book in school. Um, and if this book is in English, it's like, wow, uh, it's really nice. Everybody should hear it. But um, we, we don't uh, encourage uh, reading books in those languages that I mentioned. Uh, like we have double measures somehow. And when we talk about this with teachers uh, or even preschool teachers, um, they reflect and they like, wow, it, it looks like they haven't they haven't even noticed how we have double measures which languages are appreciated and which are like better not to be heard. For example, Roman language is a is a language that is usually um, uh, is spoken, but in schools um, children are not encouraged to speak it. Uh, it's understood as a language of uh, Roma people, they will then communicate in this language and we will not understand and we don't want them to speak in Roman language. Okay, but uh, this was just an example uh, that I thought of. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, another question now in this regard. So uh, when do we consider someone, for example, a migrant that came um, in our country or is just a guest maybe, or is living here for many decades or was even born here, but doesn't have a Slovenian surname or Montenegrin surname or so on. Uh, when do we consider someone as one of us? I would like to talk about this a little bit. So when do we say, okay, yes, of course, you are not the other, you are one of us. We don't see you as the other, like other as somebody who is not us. Um, now I would like to share with you uh, a book. So I will open this link. Uh, it's a book uh, with the um, uh, title uh, in Slovenian in in. Uh -huh. I, I just entered Eva inside. Uh, in in uh, or in English and 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 subtitle uh, stories of composed identities or in Slovenian, uh, in, in Julianske zgodbe o sestavljenih identitetah. So in Montenegrin language, it would be um, sestavljeni identiteti, composed, like uh, something that is not just a monolith, uh, but is made from many parts, many pieces, not just one way, but have imprinting, have many, if, if I use this metaphor, I think it's really nice of imprinting many different um, impacts imprinted in, in it. Uh, so uh, colleagues from the Institute for the Migration from Slovenian Academy, um, they made this, uh, this book, which is really simple and consists of stories, life stories of different people living in Slovenia uh, seeing themselves not as, for example, Slovenian, 100% Slovenian or 100% Montenegrin or Iranian or Croatian, but they are trying to think this other concept of a composed identity. 
So actually the simple idea uh, of, of the book is through uh, life stories present this not so simple, uh, maybe complicated idea of these composed identities, or maybe other concepts can be also forged or hybrid. Hybrid is also one concept that is commonly used. Hybrid like uh, mixed also, uh, which are uh, trans transcending and essential and essentialism. Essentialism is one concept, essentialism which is used uh, when we understand why one identity as natural, as something that is basic and that is not changing through time. Uh, essentialism, uh, I think you also know this word in, in your language, or we sometimes call it a substantialism, uh, like when we believe that the different cultures or nationalities or ethnicities or even races, that they have a substance that can be touched or can be measured or can be somehow caught in a, in a formula that we can show this is it, you are or you are not. Uh, so this is the strong idea that also lies behind the concepts of nation, of ethnicity. Also, if we would look at uh, etymology of those words, like nation or ethnicity, they would all lead us to very essentialistic ideas of being born into a community. So being born natio or, or, or being uh, bound, have a natural, having natural bound with your community, which is actually not uh, this family bound or not this blood bound, but it's understood as such. I will not go very much deeper into it, but I think it's very important maybe to understand also our ideas that are still uh, in a way um, partially essentialistic when we think of different groups. Uh, but the word is um, more and more um, showing us that maybe this composed or mixed or hybrid, hy hybrid view is better to understand global world. For example, when we were presenting ourselves, I think that this picture was so, so rich, so hybrid, so actually not essentialistic. No one could be just put into one um, simple uh, explanation or have just one identity, even in this regard of languages that we, that we were exposed to and so on. Um, so yeah, this was now my, my idea, trying to explain a little bit about it and to share you one part from this book, if uh, you allow. So I would open it and I also translate it one short part because I find it very interesting. Um, but there are more. So of course you can take a look and maybe it would be, it would be also interesting for you to have a look to another stories that are inside. Uh, it will not be anonymous because all those people are uh, in the book with their photo, name, full name. So the idea was not just to talk about anonymous people, but about concrete people that maybe we know, maybe they are even famous or, uh, or not. So now I would uh, open a book so that we can take a look. Please, if um, I was not clear, um, ask me for further explanation. Now, uh, please tell me, uh, can you see uh, this book? No, I have to stop sharing and share again, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, so I choose one example. This is one person from this book, and and uh, his name is Max Shoniwa Zimani. And I would like to share with you one part. I would read it in English. And if you want, you can also uh, take a look in Slovenian. Can you see? So which is, is easier. Okay, please uh, let me just read you one part and then we will discuss. Maybe uh, it will remind you on, on experience that you have or something that uh, you are part of. Um, so uh, he, uh, Max said, 
I have a passport that says I'm a citizen of Slovenia and that I live in this place for 28 years and I pay tasks which the state requests. Whether I'm Slovenian or not, uh, I don't think about it so much. In one respect, I still feel like a foreigner in Slovenia, but partially because Slovenian society does not give me feeling that I'm really accepted. I often find myself in a situation where I have to explain to people, uh, where am I from? It is not enough for them to tell them that I live in Ljubljana. Uh, they are going to keep asking me question, but where are you from? Um, I, I can say to them, well, not exactly from Ljubljana, Brezovica, near Ljubljana, 15 kilometers from Ljubljana, but they will not be satisfied with this. I can also tell them that I've been living in Ljubljana for the last 28 years, but this will still not be enough. They will want to know where I was born. And at the moment I tell them where I was born, they will be happy and they will not ask me any, any further question. So um, uh, as um, someone mentioned before, like they will close this drawer and they will say, okay, the case closed. Now we, we have them, we have him here in this uh, drawer and that's it. But he said, maybe uh, I will be also asked about wild animals, dictatorship, poverty, and all other things. But when it comes to identity, that's it. They don't think I can be Slovenian. So in this respect, they are the ones that make me even more priest to my Zimbabwean identity. I believe that human beings are capable of having com composite identity without exception. We can all have many identities and that's what we need in today's society, even more to function successfully. Okay, now I will stop sharing this part and maybe um, ask you for, for some, maybe some reaction or um, was it understandable for you? Uh, what did it mean for you? Have you been thinking about this concept of uh, composed mixed identity before? Uh-huh, okay, we have two hands, uh, Radenka and Anna. I don't know who was the first. <laughs> so both of you, please, Radenka and then Anna, maybe. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Spel. Uh, yes, I, I've been thinking about this because I, I have children that, uh, <laughs> that have these composed identities, I think. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because we, we lived first uh, one year in Portugal, two years in Italy, and then uh, we are now one year in Montenegro. They have uh, um, this experience, um, how to say, that um, they couldn't fit really uh, when, we, when we came here. So I think they don't feel like they belong uh, uh to to montenegro we had to change the school for example because uh, uh, my older son was not accepted there the uh he he's perceived as a, as a stranger no some so uh, even though he's he can speak uh, montenegrin he's different no and and i think he understand that and uh, um we didn't uh, we didn't have this problem in italy for example but um or in Portugal, but also because he was in private school. So now he's going in private school here and there is no problem because there we have people uh, who are with African origin, for example, from US or uh, from France, from, uh, I don't know, from Russia, from here, and uh, everything is fine. So I think they are used to this intercultural, international environment. They feel uh, really good there. And uh, they do not understand why children will not respond in English if they talk to them in English, for example, or, or they, they don't because they are small still. And, and uh, uh, that's maybe they will learn <laughs> that uh, slowly, but... Um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's uh, it, it's really good that uh, they are aware of uh, different cultures, 
and uh, I think they consider Italy their their uh, home country. Now. Mm -hmm. They they know Italian, they uh, know English, uh, now they know French. But uh, when when I ask them where the home is, they they think uh, that's Italy. Thank you uh, for sharing this, Verinka. Very interesting. Uh, Anna, please. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, because of the particular person who's uh, part of the story you shared, I will share with you all my own story. Uh, I will say again that I uh, come from a tourist place, but all my life I was uh, teached that I am different and upper class than the colored people, other ones, uh, Muslim people, they are different and um, don't if you if you don't need to don't socialize with them and then uh i had my daughter my little one uh she was a child and then colored people came to budva to my to my hometown and then i was like distant and strange okay i will rent you an apartment but if you live here i see you winter and summer i'm i'm distant very uh prejudice and then um my friend from my town uh got married with one of them colored people and they had a child a beautiful colored baby and I practically raised him and that was the, the 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 time the main reason that I overcame my prejudice and my and uh, start thinking um, with another brain we are all uh, the same and we are all from one country one world and then I started to be home for tourists. I know that uh, tourists maybe has their own prejudice, like I said, but I tried with every single them, every single one of them to be their home. Where is your home? My home is where my friends are, where I love food. I love the sea and I love the sun. So. I became home to everyone, to colored people, to Muslim people, to my own people. Uh, you need to love them and respect them. And I, I think that, that that is the main reason that they will call you home. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for sharing. Both of you, uh, those personal. Uh -huh, Svetlana? I actually I just wanted to, to give a brief comment on what Radenka said and what Anna said. Uh, unlike Anna, I was actually uh, taught that uh, all people are the same. So I was lucky, uh, in, lucky enough to, to have that sort of thinking in my basic fam family when I was a child. Uh, and uh, I really, uh, it was just a Part, part of my beliefs from the early childhood and which were uh, even more profound with my own experiences. And that's why all of my children, I, um, I taught, uh, I, I was teaching the same thing. So uh, according to, uh, I, I just wanted to comment what Radenka said about her children. Uh, for example, my uh, second son uh, had... Um, had his best friend who was American. And he was delighted that uh, he has an American friend and that uh, he's from other cultures so that they can, they, they can speak in English so they can learn more. So he was really 
he was uh, like honored to have a friend from a different different culture and uh, when that boy left for hungary uh, last year my 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 son was devastated he was really really very very sad because he considered him his his best friend so uh, i would say that basically uh, the core of our prejudice are our primary families so what we learned or what we uh, what we um, uh, perceived as truth in our early childhood was that core around which we build up ourselves as, as, as personalities. So it would, uh, like in Anna's case, it would take really uh, a strong, uh, strong life experience to change that core which was built from the old, early childhood. So basically, uh, I think that uh, it would be, it would be the the main um, task of every person, of every parent especially, to educate themselves about not being full of prejudice and then to educate their children too. So it would be like sort of um, some um, fire that we give to next generation, like not fire, source of light that we give to next generation as a, as a basis, base, basis for, for happier life when you don't have a prejudice your life is much more happier because you don't see in other people obstacles you see just people thank you Setlana. okay thank you very much for uh sharing uh, those stories on different levels and those reflections uh, I'm glad that uh, we had, uh, for example, one uh, of Radenka, uh, which is not on racial uh, issue, but is just like being coming from different cultures, um, not being completely home here. And then Anas, which was also yeah. like um, connected to the race as a skin color. And I think that we are also moving uh, slowly uh, towards uh, understanding that it's the similar process. And in the next part, we will talk about racism uh, and nationalism or ethnocentrism, but we will not go into details uh, what is racism and what are the differences amongst uh, racism and nationalism, but we will just, um, we will just discuss this uh, paradigm that is actually uh, not really connected only with, with a skin color. Processes are uh, similar. And we consider racism uh, contemporary, uh, in contemporary uh, understanding as something broader, cultural racism, which is not connected only with the race as a skin color or something uh, essential, but uh, also connected with the uh, culture, something which is not seen. The difference is that maybe something is seen on the first sight or not. Um, when uh, you were uh, talking about it, I um, wanted to share with you, uh, there is a book. Uh, I, I shared a link, but in Slovenian, maybe you can also find it in another languages uh, for children. Uh, author is uh, Rafik Shami uh, from Germany, uh, born in, I think, in Syria. Uh, this is the book, uh, I would translate the title, like how my brave daddy lost a fear, uh, fear of foreigners. And there are some really uh, nice uh, subtle uh, points in this story. Uh, and one is, um, I, I re Anna's, um, Anna's discussion reminded me on this, how it's from the point of view of this daughter. She is observing her daddy, how she is afraid of her friends that are from the other culture. And he doesn't say anything, but she knows it because when people of color are, um, for example, approaching her or are in the lift together with, with them, uh, he just uh, holds her hand a little bit stronger. And that's enough. He doesn't need to say anything, but he just holds her. Um, and probably he's not even aware. Um, so I just wanted to, yeah, to, to uh, give you uh, an idea how subtle signs from the parent, from the adult world 
are maybe enough to, to give uh, impression or to give idea to children, oh, it's dangerous or uh, it's something that it's not really common, that it's not part of what mommy want me to be um, with and so on. Uh, this was one thing I wanted to share and maybe now it's time um, before we go for the break just to share with you two more photos. Yeah, I wanted to do a lot with pictures because I said that we will be from different parts and maybe this language of pictures is sometimes uh, stronger. Oh, where is it? Sorry. Uh -huh. No, no, this one. This is for uh -huh, this one. Uh, these uh, pictures are from one exhibition that was in Ljubljana years ago, uh, uh, Open Faces of Racism. So maybe if you will want to search, but I will share with you this anyway. Uh, so we quick learn, we learn quickly. Maybe if you have something to add, then just to, to show you. Uh, these pictures are... Uh, yeah, pictures mainly are good, um, a good beginning for the discussion about these topics. I use them uh, very often in our discussion. And I have just two more to share with you, which are connected to this topic that we just opened. Uh, another one, uh, again, from this same exhibition. So uh, Roma, Gypsy Roma treated a second category or accepted if musician regarding these dual measures or these ideas. Where is the place for certain groups, certain minority, certain culture in our society? Um, we, uh, yeah, maybe on the first side, it's not a tragedy or it's, yeah, of course, they are musicians. Why not saying it? But uh, even in the academic level, for example, I had experience uh, when uh, a student um, made um, her thesis about uh, Roma in school, uh, Roma pupils in school, but uh, she was using art therapy, but not music. And then uh, the commission on our faculty, their first question was, but why not music? They are musicians, right? They are nothing else but musicians. Why, why, why art? Why not only music? Um, so yeah, and another one, which is I, I like it a lot, but it's maybe opening some other uh, other questions. And for Slovenian, um, for Slovenian environment, it's like really strong message. I don't know if you find anything in it. It's this question that I, I posed before. Um, uh, so when do we consider someone as one of us? Uh, when it doesn't matter anymore if the name is different or the skin color is different. When it comes to football, like this is also showing, this is like a French uh, a football team. Uh, and for example, yeah, they are all French people, no doubt, but in the other context, they will not be considered as French people. So if they are football players and we can be proud, of course, they are ours. They are, of course. But if we will have another situation, we will have to divide and we say, no, they can't be. They, no, no way. They cannot be part of our country. So we still have these native ethnocentric views, but we are willing to change it when it comes to interest. Okay, um, I will now stop sharing. Um, now I would suggest that maybe we would uh, use a few more minutes for um, a reflection, or maybe if uh, somebody would like to add something, yes? Yeah, I, I want to uh, just the, the first photo you showed about racism. And um, I think I read somewhere that that children are up to the age of six or seven do not distinguish the color of the skin, that they see all people the same. And uh, I remember when I read that, I asked my, my boys, like, um, 
they have friends, Russell and Trevor at school. And I said, well, uh, what is different between you and Russell and Trevor? And they both said, they speak American accent. <laughs> so that was it. And I, I think that's, that's really something that we should uh, pay attention. And in particular today, when we have this uh, extreme uh, politics in Montenegro, no? Everybody wants to be, uh, uh, to emphasize their nationality and uh, it's, it's very uh, dangerous, I think. And uh, we should be very careful when what we are teaching our children. And I would also uh, say that I don't know if our, our if teachers at primary school or maybe uh, in all in, in higher education as well have uh, this, um, um, I don't know, uh, workshops or, or, or some uh, uh, education in, in towards that so that, um, that are, do they know how to accept children, pupils who are different than the average? Uh, I think that's something I, I was uh, coping, for example, last at the beginning of the school year because it, it was difficult and we decided. And thank you, Sathana, for telling about your son because yes, there are people. My, my son has friends, but they are not, they were not in the same class. They, he has uh, friends from Podgorica, but uh, uh, they're not from the same class. He didn't know. He was one month in the classroom, of course, with all the measures from COVID, with COVID and everything. It was difficult to uh, establish a, a real connection, but also what I noticed that they didn't talk. So there was, nobody was talking to him, but also other children were not talking. I, I think also that was due to the COVID restrictions. They were, I don't know, one meter, two meters apart with masks and everything. Maybe, maybe it was the wrong timing also, but uh, I think the teacher had to play better role in uh, uh, accepting uh, newcomer no, to the group. That's all. Yes, thank you. Uh, even uh, later on, when we will be talking about interculturality in higher education, uh, we cannot um, think think about it without thinking also other levels in in the society. Yeah, of course, even um, education, lower education levels like primary school, it's all so interconnected. So, um, and yes, we are uh, here on on faculty of education. We have certain subjects that are dealing with it and. Uh, when I, I do it, I, I think it's really endless because it's so important to share these personal experiences and personal views and gain experiences and be willing to learn. And this is not uh, always like this. Um, so I think it's important on all the levels to reflect and to become more conscious about uh, our own um, views, I will not say prejudice, stereotypes, but really general. Um, okay, uh, I will share now um, this uh, video that I mentioned before, and I think you will like it. So when you will have time, it's about maybe 20 minutes of Shimamanda Ngozi Adishe. Maybe I will ask you tomorrow if you had chance um, to, to take a look, we can discuss a little bit. I'm glad that the discussion started. Uh, I hope that also others which are not so uh, active in the discussions are uh, having interesting uh, time and that you, you have something for you. Uh, maybe I would, I'm a little bit curious because we are more or less from similar, uh, yeah, like for example, from the similar part of the world. Uh, so I'm curious how a bishop, how is it um, relevant for you? I would like to hear you if you maybe you have some reflection. Uh, can you please uh, turn on uh, the microphone? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I do feel once we move from one culture to different culture, initially, uh, it is difficult to get acceptance from the people. But uh, even we should not have uh, uh, much expectation because it is quite natural because the culture from one place is different from other place. And if we are moving and uh, living with a people with different culture, we need to adopt their culture. 
uh, and uh, slowly uh, slowly those uh, people they started accepting us because acceptance uh, it not happens in a one day we have to show that okay we are uh, just like you we are uh, we are also human uh, as you are and uh, uh, slowly it, it 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 takes time because nothing happens in a day uh, and we have to learn their culture we have to accept their language as our own language so that they will start accepting if i am trying to pose my culture to them even i am living with them then it is not supposed to be good uh, that is what it's a process and it, it's quite natural uh, uh, just like if we see a, ch a child uh, whether the, a child from one culture or to another culture but if we uh, keep a child of different culture they will be friend in a minute but why it not happen for a people because once we we are uh, we are getting elder and we are uh, we are just get some uh, education we start dividing ourselves with other others that that, that will come with with, uh, with that uh, time pass with uh, once we will show our um, that okay we are with you we are uh, we are like you we have to we have to be like them then only the acceptance will come else it is very difficult is as per my understanding okay thank you i hope uh, it's relevant and understandable also for you yeah um, certainly yes okay thank you uh, because uh, yeah it's a little bit uh, challenging um because when when we discuss all those topics here in our environment uh, there are different codes you know and different situations and in in each context it's it's really different and we need some time to um, somehow in tune. So I think now we did it. Um, yeah. yeah uh, there was one more thing I wanted to, to say before before going to the break, just not to lose all these uh, uh, all these ideas that you shared. Uh, there was one one point. I think Radenka, that you when you were talking about this experience of trying to go in the public school and then going to international school. Uh, tomorrow, we will be discussing this difference between uh, multiculturalism and uh, interculturalism. And I think this is the basis, actually, uh, when we, um, when, for example, we have um, communities or, or we have um, schools uh, where yeah, like international schools uh, where, where it's easier and people are like from all different spaces, different, the different places, different countries, different languages, and, and it's much easier. But on the other side, uh, this public school um, will not have experience to learn uh, because people would, would feel, oh, maybe it's better go to this school because it's easier. And if they will not have this experience of diversity, they will not have a chance to learn. I think it's similar with accepting other, other races. Yes, when they are really small, they don't, um, they don't realize that it's such a strong category, that it's so important. Why it's so important? Not not like the color of eyes or, or color of hair, but color of skin. But uh, very very soon they will realize because they will get this message from the adult world. And um, we have one uh, colleague here in Slovenia. She has one child from uh, from uh, adopted from one African uh, country, and she said that very soon when they were little, on the um, in the park, uh, small children came and they tried to like to clean him because they thought, oh, he was maybe uh, just dirty. Because in Slovenia, we have one uh, really common story for children. Probably you don't know it about Yuri Muri. Yuri Muri is a boy uh, who thinks that in Africa people are people don't have to wash, they are dirty, and he wants to go to Africa because he doesn't want to wash. And this is the story that we all know. It's actually a poem, and it's from a really famous uh, author, a really appreciated author, Tune Pauček. 
but there are a lot of discussion about it. What kind of representation of race of uh, Africa children are gaining through such literature? Maybe later I will show you just to get an impression. I will uh, give you a picture in the chat. So maybe it's not strange that very soon when they're a few years old, they already think, oh, probably he's just, uh, we just need to wash him and he will be like we are. This is maybe just an anecdote to add. Okay, uh, so in the next part of today's uh, meeting, um, I wanted to discuss with you a few more core concepts. Uh, identity, uh, minority-majority interactions, then racism, nationalism and discrimination a little bit more. And um, finally, institutional, institutional racism. I wanted to give you a few examples and maybe hopefully also you can share some examples from your professional environment or just, yeah. In a few topics, I hope you see the screen. Uh, so here are a few concepts. Uh, I, I call them core concepts uh, for the understanding of uh, intercultural processes uh, within a higher ed education and generally. So uh, we will touch the topic of identity a little bit and then discuss minority-majority interactions at, as intergroup interactions and as I mentioned, racism, nationalism, and discrimination, and at the end, uh, institutional racism with few examples. Um, when uh, discussing identity uh, within uh, social sciences in this more uh, contemporary prism, uh, I think that um, interactionalism is uh, a core concept. Uh, so um, interactive interaction, so interactions, social interactions uh, through which identity is being built and being constructed and reconstructed. So uh, maybe in more traditional uh, view or through traditional paradigm, uh, identity was understood as something uh, stable, something uh, unchangeable, uh, the, the concept was all about how to stay the same, how not to change, like being identical to oneself. But if we go deeper into this concept, we see that, um, that uh, this uh, topic of dynamic, of um, how, how is it situated, so how it depends on different contexts, how it's expressed in different ways, in different contexts, and how it is constructed through interaction. Uh, so those uh, pictures um, probably you know uh, from Escher, uh, really actually old, <laughs> uh, not contemporary, but still I think that uh, they show really well uh, this topic of interaction. Uh, even paradox, uh, how we construct our identities being in inter interactions and how it is really difficult to point where is the beginning. So who starts in, in, in those interactions? We can uh, think about uh, interpersonal interactions, maybe dialogue between two people, or we can talk on the broader scale about intergroup relations. Uh, the theory is the same. Um, yeah, you see and how, how um, certain paradoxes even within this picture uh, drawing hands. So we cannot say where is the beginning, we cannot decide how is it possible even. It's the process of becoming um, and um, it's uh, also this circularity of uh, view when we discuss those concepts. So circularity is maybe um, something different from, from um, um, the, the understanding how one uh, factor causes other things. Like maybe we, we more, uh, we more uh, realize this in um, natural sciences, but in social sciences, 
is more a uh, circularity, or we call like krožnost, krožnost, procesnost. Uh, so one's identity is constructed regarding to the other through interactions and in this circularity of becoming. This is one uh, um, uh, axiom actually. And uh, this one from the same author also as a metaphor. Uh, I use it when we explain or when we talk about identity and uh, now we can add uh, another topics. Um, besides interactivity, so uh, encountering um, relation, re, relation uh, relationality, and then also topics that are maybe a little bit more even unpleasant or connected with the uh, social power uh, that are uh, starting to be more uh, on the side of conflict like hierarchy and also dualism and binarism. Uh, because this picture is really very full of uh, different, uh, different uh, symbols and maybe different uh, uh, ideas, I would ask you if you maybe want to share what you see besides what I mentioned when you take a look. Uh, its name is Encounter. Well, I can see that uh, uh, in every um, right person, there is part of her which is wrong. Mm -hmm. So you can see that at the very center of the picture, because if you foc if you pay if you focus your attention just to white white figures, you will see that just uh, under them uh, are. Uh, black figures. So this uh, process of incorporating one into another is actually telling us that human beings are very, very complex and that no one of us could tell that he is 100% positive or 100% negative as a person. So we are some sort of mixture of uh, light and darkness, I would say. Hello. Uh, do you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, beyond my college and my specialty uh, and my profession and my work, uh, I study uh, meditation, yoga, and health lifestyle and uh, in that that I am and that I love uh, um, I can say that we are yin and yang and in every person we have the dark and the light and you need to you need to see the dark to meet the dark to acknowledge that you are the light and uh, the previous picture uh, I have to say that in Montenegro we have um, a saying uh, you have the chicken and you have the egg can you tell me which is older you wouldn't have the chicken if you don't have the egg and you wouldn't have the egg if you don't have the chicken uh, everything is apart from each other and everything is uh, like a circle in process and you wouldn't have another if you don't have the and, and you actually don't know which is the first and which is the second and uh, I think um, in this topic um, I would I would uh, like to know your experiences and your teachings. Uh, what do you teach uh, your children about identity? Because I see that um, all of you has children, and um, mine has eight years. And I'm I know what I know. I know about racism and identity and everything, but 
I still am figuring out um, what I will tell her, what I will teach her, because uh, I don't know if I'm a chicken or I'm an egg and how to, to represent to her, how to imprint in her what I know to, to because our main uh, priority is to low everything in these topics, the racism, the everything that you say. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anna, I've heard yeah, also this uh, question uh, in your uh, response, like how to teach children about this topic. I think a little bit, we already touched it with, with cert on certain points. Yeah, like with on this um, idea how subtle is learning, how it is not always conscious. It's not the process when we would say, okay, now I'm going to teach her, for example, let's take a book and let's read these stories. It's not intentional or it's not only intentional. Uh, it's happening besides intentions. Uh, we have one um, author, uh, um, maybe you know her even, she's now very famous, <laughs> Renata Salitzel. I don't know, she's a philosopher from Slovenia, a criminologist, but uh, she was also like uh, writing a lot about, um, about education before. And she had a concept um, uh, which I, I don't know how to translate, I will try. Uh, she said that education uh, is like, hmm, even in Slovenian, it's really <laughs> difficult. Uh, it means like that it is a state uh, which is not uh, intentional, but it's, it's something that is uh, going on while doing other things and that you miss it when you, you are trying to reach it. Uh, she's... Um, uh, making this parallel with uh, trying to, to sleep, like forcing yourself, now I will sleep, but then when you start to force, then you fall asleep or falling in love. Uh, it's difficult to do it intentionally. And then she like philosophically explained that with education, uh, it's actually uh, the same, like we are doing it while living, while um, doing other things. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, unconscious, unconsciously um, in a larger, in large extent. So what is so important um, is to, to reflect again and to, to think about what just happened. Of course, to have intentions, but beside that, to reflect what happened. Um, I had those attentions, but yeah, like you said, uh, Anna, very nice, like you, I don't know. Uh, am I the chicken or the egg, which I understood she's also the part of the process. I have to interact with her when I, I try to teach her about this. So this was one idea that I had when you asked this. And other idea was, of course, uh, this topic of all the content, cultural content, literal um, movies, everything that, uh, that, yeah, that we can uh, offer to children or to students uh, and of course is forming them. Uh, I'm also doing a lot with all these, um, all those uh, things, also also curricula, but, but also literature and um, um, movies uh, like ma ma mass media, what are the messages inside uh, not that we would make a sense, like we would be a censor and say, oh, this is really not good, but just to be aware and to, again, discuss all those messages that they are, yeah, mm, they are part of. Um, and of course, uh, things that are going on, uh, like uh, everyday um, encounters are probably the best teaching experiences and we as a role models in those experiences. Um, yeah, maybe so far I had this, this uh, thoughts about uh, this topic. 
And uh, thank you uh, for sharing uh, on, on, on this picture. Uh, we actually uh, reflected quite on an uh, intrapersonal level, how it, it is something which we can understand inside us already. And now it's also a challenge how to understand that these same processes are going on in the society, uh, in the intergroup relations or our interpersonal relations. Um, uh, and this encounter or uh, even uh, hands uh, is also not meant only to reflect our intrapersonal uh, happening, but what is going on also on the level of our countries, for example, because you mentioned before those struggles um, amongst uh, different groups. Uh, so this black and white uh, symbolic and this hierarchy and this idea that we define ourselves according to the other. So um, we uh, define ourselves uh, not only, okay, we are both here in the same position, but unfortunately in the society, um, uh, this is uh, always happening in some um, power play or, or in, in hierarchical way. So we are posing ourselves higher or, or lower to this position and we assign certain, um, uh, certain uh, qualities to this white or to this black. So this is a little bit maybe of trying to uh, broader this on uh, processes that are going on uh, in the society. And um, connected with all this, uh, how the process of identity making, of posing ourselves as better than other nationality or than other ethnicity or other gender or uh, linguistical group or whatever, um, this process is always uh, hierarchical. And uh, here uh, I present you, or maybe just mention you, uh, one uh, theory which is very um, present in social sciences, a uh, symbolic interactionism, uh, which um, is a paradigm explaining this interac interactional nature of identity making. Uh, so uh, the theory defines socially mediated attitudes of the individual towards oneself, or in the other words, um, it explains to us that identity is not only what we would feel for ourselves, who I am, but it's also how others define us, uh, how others see us, uh, how we, uh, we experience ourselves, and there is no objective or pre-social identity. Uh, every identity is social identity somehow. Um, uh, I would maybe to make it a little bit more clear uh, when I talk with students about this theory and about the process of identity making and how to understand identity, we make a very simple exercise, which maybe now we cannot do, but for, uh, for the homework uh, I can give you because it's really short. So the exercise is just um, when you will be at home with somebody or with a friend on the coffee or whatever. So when you will have one person beside you, just um, look uh, to each other's eyes. And yeah, usually when we, when we look to, uh, to each other's eyes, we try to see the other person. Uh, but in this exercise, I will ask you to try to see yourself. So your reflection in the other person's eyes. So you will maybe have to look a little bit deeper, but uh, it is possible. And it's very simple. If we have glasses or sunglasses, then we can see our reflection. But the idea is uh, to realize when we are in interactions, of course, we interact with other people. But every time we look to the other people, we are uh, trying to, or, or even not knowing, uh, we are um, getting messages of uh, who we are. Uh, and this theory is actually very basic, uh, but it's still important 
uh, also for all the professions working with uh, other people or in my field of social pedagogy when we for example we work with marginalized groups a lot uh, because this kind of theories um, they um, gives give us insight uh, how important is uh, how do we interact with the people that are our users or our um, customers or students um, so um, the messages that we give uh, the way that we approach the language that we use uh, even the ideas that we we have or prejudices that we have um, it is all somehow i will again use our word from today it's imprinting in their identity that's why they are becoming how how we see us uh, maybe just for explanation, this theory was also very much used uh, on the field of um, delinquency, especially when uh, thinking about minors, uh, because it helped uh, professions uh, to realize uh, how uh, those uh, repressive measures towards young people when they are minor minors are um, just strengths making stronger um, their deviant identity and how important it is uh, to, um, to abolish, for example, uniforms or other repressive measures, just maybe just for, for uh, a little bit uh, uh, bigger picture. And uh, here I mentioned also Goffman, author of uh, labeling theory, or stigma, maybe you call it, um, or maybe you know it uh, by the name of stigma, but labeling, so give, giving other people labels, uh, seeing them through certain certain glasses or certain prisma, we can, uh, we call this process uh, stigmatized identity. So our prisma or our labeling are becoming part of others' identity. Um, Okay, and now uh, we will uh, go uh, further and we will build upon this idea of how identity is not only something very individual or very personal, but is something very interactive, is something dynamic, changing, uh, not monolith, as we already said in the first time, but actually consists of many parts and can be also expressed in different ways uh, regarding what is the concept, context uh, demanding from us. If we are in a foreign country, other perspectives will come in front than, for example, in, if we are in our family um, and maybe we will be another person because we will be just perceived in different way. Um, today, I already mentioned that we will not uh, so much go into details how all those concepts, racism, nationalism, ethnocentrism, and then discriminations are um, different. Of course, there are differences and we could go in depth uh, about each of them, but we will now try to, to uh, merge them somehow and uh, talk about what is common and what is this process that is important to understand. Um, I uh, described, race, described uh, racism as uh, unfounded, so without foundation, uh, we cannot found it uh, scientifically or anyhow, it's unfounded belief that different races possess uh, distinct characteristics, abilities or qualities, especially to distinguish them as inferior or superior to one another or uh, uh, even prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism, so conflict by an individual community or institution against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular racial or ethnic or cultural group. Uh, especially we talk about it when, um, uh, it, uh, uh, when there is a minority or marginalized group. Um, yeah, okay, negative. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, now actually we will already move um, to slowly to institutionalized um, 
racism to this part because uh -huh, no first maybe one more thing i wanted to check this in the break but then i forgot just to to make sure how um how to name it um there are many definitions of course uh, but i wanted to mention one distinction in slovenian language uh, we call it notrani and zunani so unutrašni i ne i vanski racism so interior and exterior uh, and um, why i'm telling this this um exterior means that one group stronger group is trying to somehow get rid of this minority so their idea is not to let them in or um somehow trying to like yeah for them the best would be that this minority wouldn't exist um this would be their goal it would be better without them uh, like a genocides or um or other other practices but um, this interior ra racism which is maybe even more common um is something else and uh, means that uh, this stronger group or majority uh, doesn't have for the aim to get rid of the minority um, but the idea is that majority somehow needs minority but in the independent position um, in the position of um, um, uh, i'm searching for this word um, Potlacheni, um, oppressed, oppressed. Like oppressed, yes, sorry, uh, like they, they need them to oppress them in one way or another. And we are already talking about more subtle practices, which are maybe even so, um, so natural in the society that are not seen anymore. Uh, we would say yes of course they are doing all those dirty jobs yeah it, this is like this um it's their decision uh, nobody made them to but yes of course um they have they have to do it why, why not and we don't question anymore why for example certain social positions are assigned for uh, certain social groups so we know uh, many many practices of this inner or somehow internal racism, uh, which is yeah much more um, much more subtle and even much much more resistant somehow. Uh, we will talk about this a little bit more uh, tomorrow, uh, but uh, I just want to maybe broader broaden a little bit um, because first idea if we would see these practices would be as racism nationalism. All this means. Uh, being rude or being uh, hateful uh, towards minority or towards another group. So it means um, being hateful in face-to-face -face practices, uh, using hate speech, um, being explicit, uh, so being violent. And probably we would all say, no, we are not, of course, being violent, we are not being part of it. Um, but again, if uh, if it happens, we would accuse it and say, no, of course, we are not supporting racism. We are not supporting violence. Uh, but I will show you uh, in the now in the uh, next uh, few minutes uh, that um, certain uh, theories like critical racial theories uh, showed us that not only this explicit uh, hate speech or violent acting is racism but much much more uh, how uh, all, all those concepts nationalism ethnocentrism and discriminations are i would say embedded uh, in our institutions and are um acting through those practices that we are also part of in a subtle implicit way okay now we, uh -huh, this we already uh, showed uh, so when we are talking about institutional racism or discrimination or nationalism or even institutional violence which is not face-to-face -face violence but is violence which is perceived through institution 
uh, we, yeah, for example, have to mention this paradigm of critical racial studies, studies uh, which uh, showed us that racism is not only something very direct, um, um, like um, I said, violence toward other group, ethnic, cultural, racial, linguistical, but also functioning of institutions, of system that treats them unequal or keeps the gap between two groups or more groups. And here in institutions are functioning as gatekeepers. I think this uh, word is quite important or quite illustrative, like gatekeepers, somebody who is not letting go, just it's the way it is. Um, we cannot do anything, but we still act as uh, gatekeepers. Um, institutional racism exists on different levels, on all the levels uh, of educational system, employment, housing, culture, politics, or anywhere else, and is like embedded in everyday practice and is subtle. Um, and of course, uh, the what what we want to do. What, why am I talking about it? Uh, because our duty or our task is to reflect and to change these self-evident institutional practices that we can, um, uh, when we open eyes, we can see what is going on because uh, it's um, on uh, somehow unavoidable. We cannot uh, avoid it. It's uh, happening on and on and it's a process. Okay, and I will give you now a few examples just to, to show uh, what all can be uh, institutional, uh, uh, institutional discrimination. Uh, and maybe then I would ask you also to, um, to uh, think if you will um, maybe, if, if you can think of of practices that you you know or you are familiar with. So the, my first example is actually latest news uh, from a few days ago. Uh, I decided to take a photo from the news from Delo, so our daily paper. Um, it says, Ovira uh, zatuje studente and škoda za slovensko visoko šolstvo. So in English, it would mean uh, obstacle for foreign students and harm for Slovenian higher education. Because uh, latest suggested changes uh, of our government, of Slovenian, of the Slovenian immigration law, um, suggested that foreign students should from now on provide about uh, 5,000 euro for obtaining the study visa. So they should provide all this money um, to, to show that they are financially independent. And this is, of course, a big change that this law, which is, of course, very broad immigration law and student part is only one part inside. Of course, there is a discussion now, and I hope that it will not just go through so easily. Um, but it's a try and if it would happen of course it would be very difficult for certain students especially those who are not um, socio-economically so well um, stated it would be of course a big obstacle to come even to study in Slovenia. Um, uh -huh, I have another example before I ask you if maybe can think of something uh, this is one example that I uh, quite uh, often experienced uh, wh while uh, accompanying, accompanying um, students to um, office for, for foreigners. Uh, so this is one uh, article, again, um, two years old or yeah, some year and a half. And the title says, Drugo uh, razredni, so it would mean like second class, they, they get second class treatment and um, they are, um, mm, uh, yeah, they, they are stating in the article that quality of public administration for foreigners, also for foreign students, is worse as for Slovenian citizens. There are very long queues, even hours before opening, lack of personal, complete unavailability by phone. 
uh, yeah, I all experienced all this. Um, sometimes uh, probably it was just so many people at that time, but um, I remember our students uh, waking up at four uh, so that they could be at five in the morning in the queue uh, because they would open at eight and then they wouldn't wait so long because it was just just filled and um, there was nothing uh, you could do and even users of this office uh, wouldn't complain they would just wait and stay and they wouldn't have their um, uh, presenters who would um, say something uh, you can see that for example this article is two years old and I think it's the only one that I could find but I know that the problem is quite huge uh, this queue is not the only thing, uh, also no translations, forms are only in Slovenian language, very difficult bureaucratic language, it's really difficult to, to get a response. Uh, even for us from the university sometimes, um, and then you can see how is it, for example, for students who are not yet uh, speaking Slovenian language. Um, this was... Uh, Another example uh, here, I wanted to give, of course, on the other side, it's not only one sided, but we have um, many, many other initiatives, not from the state uh, office administration, but maybe from the university or touristic um, field. And those are very inviting and very welcoming. So it's the other story. Uh, there are translations, there are privileges that you have, of course, and yeah, being student in Slovenia is a privilege and so on. Uh, but this, this uh, part is a little bit more hard. Okay, uh, so um, maybe uh, you would like to comment something or um, I'm interesting, interested if you have a similar experience or if you thought of something while listening to me. Uh -huh. Yes, please, Radenka. So I, uh, I mentioned before I lived in several uh, EU countries and uh, I think the treatments of, of non-EU uh, students is similar to this in Slovenia when you go to uh, do bureaucracy stuff to apply for a, a permit of stay or, or a st student visa. Um, uh, but things are changing. For example, I was in Italy 20 years ago and I was two years ago and uh, things are changing for better. Let's say that. Uh, uh, although you feel a bit uh, yeah, you feel a second, uh, uh, how did you say, a second, second degree, class. second class, yes, yeah. it's always the feeling you have, uh, but uh, for example, 20 years ago, or when I was in Venice 2002, uh, uh, it was surreal uh, seeing these uh, queues of uh, people, like you said, at five o'clock in the morning, you have to get up to queue, and then there is a uh, um, officer from Pastura coming there and saying, seeing a black person in a queue first in the line, saying, "No, you will get out to the to and be the last," and he had and and he obeyed. So this was the class. This was something, uh, yeah, for me, unimaginable to treat people like this, but it it uh, happened and. Um, yeah, uh, I uh, think, sim uh, for example, I, when I was in, in Paris, uh, um, I, it was a short uh, stay for six months and they asked me, it was a procedure for non-EU, um, people who, coming from non-EU countries, they sh were treated like uh, uh, coming from uh, Brazil or from uh, Africa or so, that, that was the same, even if you are in Europe. And uh, I... Uh, Remember that uh, they asked for me uh, a medical test. I had to go to their doctor. It was for all uh, third country students. We had to pass the, the, the check and uh, they didn't want to recognize, I don't know, my vaccination uh, card uh, uh, because they said, oh, 
we are not sure, maybe you have tuberculosis. We want to have your X-ray uh, uh, check of your uh, of your chest, no, of your lungs. And uh, I refused because I was pregnant, uh, I think three months pregnant or four months pregnant. And uh, uh, so that was, for example, uh, something I, I had to fight for, not to have this X-ray uh, chest uh, uh, examination. And then finally I got it and, uh, um, but for me, it was something really crazy. I didn't expect that to happening in France, for example. Mm -hmm. The only uh, country, yeah, the country I really have uh, ex with excellent experience is Portugal. I did everything in one day. So one day they, actually twice I, I went, uh, one day was to give me the appointment, come in a month time and uh, it, everything was finished. So it was perfect, really. And uh, I, I, it was so easy and uh, um, I, I felt fine. So it was very, very nice and, uh, and uh, positive experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So diverse experience is, huh? yeah. Um, uh, when when uh, we were doing this activity before a uh, guest uh, who is coming to our department, now, um, if I look back, uh, we, uh, we never touched, for example, this administrative part, more institutionalized part, financial. Okay, we thought about apartment, about food, about socializing, uh, but not, not about all those uh, things, uh, which are also showing uh, somehow how welcoming country are we, or are we really inviting, or maybe uh, making really obstacles that that people cannot, um, um, yeah, somehow uh, approach um, because this is this hard part, and we were thinking about more soft, um, soft part, if we could say so. Um, okay, uh, this activity we will probably, uh -huh. We will probably uh, have tomorrow if we decide, uh, not today. Um, okay, uh, here I have a short view on educational system, uh, including a higher education as a field that, of course, we expect should overcome racism and uh, re reduct inequality. But not only uh, higher education, now we will, we will take a look on all the levels of education. And um, if we look at the facts, in most uh, European Union countries, or even European countries, not only EU, uh, people with migra migrant background are more often undereducated. That means that their education is lower than of general population and more often unemployed. Uh, here is the source where I got this uh, from, but of course we can get this data on many, many different uh, research. It's not only one, unfortunately. Uh, only, uh, also I did this research in Slovenia uh, several years ago. Maybe it's also a little bit interesting for you because we were a common country. Maybe we were all born most of us huh, in um, former Yugoslavia in common country. And then we had this situation how people from other Yugoslav countries became uh, migrants like from one day to another when, when Slovenia became independent in 1990s. Uh, so it was a really big issue on all the levels, uh, on educational level, on level of social inclusion. And uh, yeah, I was actually a lot uh, dealing with this a lot. And I also realized that this educational gap exists still in Slovenia, uh, not only with first generation, but also second or third generation. So um, it looks like we are not successful. Um, our educational system is not successful in this means that it would overcome this gap because it's still staying and it's, it is still showing. But on the, on the other hand, I have to tell you that usually it's not about other nationalities, other cultures, but there is uh, something else um, 
that is um, uh -huh, just a second, Vedenka, that is hiding behind, and it's a social economical status. So if we wouldn't consider social economical status, then those differences wouldn't be obvious. So it's um, it's a, it's about not letting um, um, people with migrant background in this socio-economical matter uh, to include in the society. Uh, yeah, Radinka, please. Uh, yeah, now when you mentioned th this difference in um, social background, everything I, it came to my mind when I uh, arrived to Belgium to Antwerp. Uh, in 2004 to finish my PhD, to do the second part of my PhD. I, I think it was the second day I arrived, I got a letter, invitation from the, like welcome letter from the mayor of Antwerp saying, welcome Radenka Krismanovic to Antwerp. Uh, we are happy to have you here. Uh, we wish you, I know, good uh, stay. Uh, and uh, so I was, <laughs> really surprised and they offer me uh, this um, uh, he invited me so it, it was also the invitation to go uh, to the uh, language course that was organized for free by the city council and uh, um, so it was really uh, a, a real welcome so I went together with the uh, uh, some other uh, PhD students, postdocs from, from my university that were in my lab. And uh, that was a real experience. So uh, having uh, uh, this uh, 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 Flemish uh, language lessons with people, I don't know, they were um, uh, from Africa, from Albania, from, I don't know, from all around uh, Europe. Uh, but they the, mostly they were, uh, I think just three or four of us were from university, all the rest were this social, uh, lower social status. And uh, the first question they asked us was, who of you uh, knows to read and write? Mm -hmm. So there were people, uh, so th this was a distinguish, the, they had to distinguish us uh, on, on that uh, basis. So uh, I I think we finished the course because it was a, a completely a new experience mm -hmm. and we wanted to, to, to have this really it was a, uh, and, and then later when we finished the first course we went to university uh, course that was offered for students but mm -hmm. it was a really a great experience. Mm -hmm. And certainly a good practice and also this part that uh, you are mixed and that you can yeah not so not uh, divided uh, on the uh, yeah, but we place. were we were equal yeah. because nobody knew Flemish so uh, yeah. we were really zero uh, yeah. <laughs> knowledge on that but uh, the background was completely different yeah yeah, yeah thank you uh, yeah so it, it's yeah it's important also then um, to stress the importance of socio-economical background because of course it can be different and we know uh, many many uh, forms of migration but still economic migration where uh, the like non-qualified -quali uh, working force so-called is like uh, still the majority and this is this uh, color with, with which all is then colored somehow but within this picture, there are many uh, nuances. It's not uh, all the same. So uh, also in Slovenia, if we would divide and see, okay, there are families, um, higher education of parents, uh, better situated financially, uh, usually um, these um, difficulties of inequality are not so persistent. Or if we can see then these statistics that shows just some trends, no, they, they don't have, they, they can include. So the real problem is more on inequality level, financial inequality, which is not, of course, only financial. It's also connected with, with other, um, other fields. Uh, so now we will come uh, to the question. Um, if we, we see that due to ethnic, cultural, family experience, um, students or members or of minorities, uh, okay, here I mentioned Roma. I will see if we will go into this discussion today, especially of Roma people. Um, uh, although they are equally capable as others, this is one thing that we have to stress, and professionals that are, for example, 
um, researching uh, Roma education or inclusion, the first thing that they always say and stress very much is uh, they are equally capable. Uh, just their um, background position is not equal, but their capability capabilities are equal, uh, basically. Because uh, this belief of uh, equal capabilities is still not so well uh, accepted amongst, for example, staff, professionals, and so on. Uh, so uh, all those minorities, um, even students or individual students, uh, would of course need some additional support within the educational system, like extra hours of language or learning support to bridge unequal starting position. And then in the future, we will take a look at uh, how can we now here respond to this need. So we say, okay, they would need, but how? Uh, some of this you already did in uh, previous um, trainings, but maybe now we will today or tomorrow, we will show some other possibilities or thinkings uh, on this. And yes, a school uh, doesn't really do this. Um, uh, although it's public school has this role uh, of uh, bridging this gap of inequality, but in Slovenia, unfortunately, uh, we, we have to say that it's not so successful. So this gap is still present. Uh, and even we believe very much in importance of preschool, for example, if Roma um, children will go in preschool, so if it, they will enter a school system really early, then their difficulties will be um, will be smaller, but it's not really like this. We have some research which is showing that it's not so big difference if they enter earlier or if they don't enter earlier. So it's again um, our need to consider our system and these beliefs that it's really better if they spend more time in the educational system. Uh, we maybe have few Roma uh, people from Roman community in, um, in higher education, few, few, really maybe we could count them on, on one, one hand. And I believe then in Montenegro it's probably the same. Uh, do you know something about this maybe? Because I know that you also have Roma, uh, Roma minority. In Montenegro. I have to admit that I didn't notice any Roma children in our kindergarten. <laughs> I don't know, is it a systematic error or something like that? Uh, I also uh, didn't notice um, in, um, in primary schools, perhaps I, I noticed just two or three examples. So basically I was wondering if um, um, perhaps that they have their own schools like that that are not schools in in right meaning of that word but some sort of trainings or which different NGO, NGOs do with them but actually I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure I know that there is a, a association of Roma people and uh, that they have a uh, I don't know, when there is a day of Roma culture, or day of the Roma language, they organize different uh, exhibitions or something like that. But if I, if I could, if I noticed uh, correctly, it's basically always just within two or three names. So I was even thinking perhaps that's they, their own private NGO, so they just uh, do it in order to, I don't know, to promote uh, uh, Roma culture through projects for which they gain, gain money or something like that. But I didn't notice that the system is especially, um, um, how to say, kind with them according to educational things. But uh, when it comes to uh, health issues, I noticed that they, they get uh, all help and all services which, are, which, which they need uh, on equal uh, equal um, uh, level like all the others. So mm -hmm. apparently education is one um, hole, black hole, where they don't get what they should uh, get. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that it, it, it uh, should be definitely changed in the future. Definitely. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, Svetlana, when I was preparing, I also checked a little bit and found a few pages like uh, minorities of Montenegro and I saw that there is something written about Roma minority also. Uh, but yes, yeah, still also when I um, visit Montenegro, I hardly get a connection. So I, I have an impression that it's somehow hidden topic still, exactly. not so much mainstreamed yet. Yeah. In Slovenia, maybe it's not so hidden. We talk about this a lot, but uh, results are not uh, not really good. Mm. Uh, we really, really, really have few just in this educational regard. Um, at the moment, maybe even nobody enrolled in higher education. Uh, in this book that I uh, opened before and end when we, we, we saw the story, there is also one story of uh, Natasha Brajdić. Um, um, yeah, a woman from Roma community with successful story. She became um, uh, educated, academic, and uh, did a job of a police officer for quite some time. And maybe I will just share a short impression from her story. When she she was yeah she she was included in school, uh, Dolenska part of one region here in Slovenia where a uh, large Roma community uh, lives. And then she reflected how Roma community was in school, but uh, the idea was that they are just here for a few years and then they are gone. Nothing will, uh, they will not be successful at all. And and then she 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 reflected, like she said, that she had one teacher that she felt uh, she believes in her, and she really is curious. What does she want? And then she remember how this teacher asks her. Natasha, what would you like to become? This question was so essential for her. And she said, wow, I, I said, wow, she's really asking me um, uh, like this gajo, they, they call uh, Slovenian people like foreigners. She asking me and she really want to know. And then she said, how difficult was it to say, oh, I would really like to work in kindergarten. And then a uh, teacher responded, Natasha, it's great. Uh, you would help us in, in kindergarten. We will work together. We need you. She said that something, uh, something moved inside her because she saw somebody believes in her and gives her strength to continue to say, wow. Uh, she, she didn't say, no, no way, dream on. But she said, yes, we need you. We will work together. Okay, it was a small small part in her narrative, um, but I still, it's somehow it's strong and it's not the only thing, of course, uh, supportive family and uh, yeah, many factors needs to be there. Yeah, just, okay, uh, maybe to touch uh, this, this topic also, because when we talk about uh, inequality in higher education, uh, I also uh, always want uh, that we, um, we touch the topics that are, somehow missing, uh, not only talk about what is there, but also what is not there. Uh, it's, not, it's like an um, empty place and we are not discussing it because it's also the part of racism or discrimination to, to ignore or to think it's like this and it will stay. But no, like you said, Svetlana, it will need to change. And uh, on the level of uh, health, maybe you have really good um, example how to how to start uh, okay no we only have 10 more minutes uh, so um, uh, let me see what can we uh, where where can we conclude for today i would also uh, like to to say something about a uh, reported discrimination according to the um, same uh, researches that i mentioned even uh, earlier uh, Roma uh, migrants from Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle East countries are those um, that are reporting uh, the most discrimination, but very important topic is unreported discrimination, which is of course very difficult to talk about and really of course difficult to measure. How can we know if it's unreported? But there are also research about this unreported and why people do not report because they are, of course, not aware that this is discrimination, they are not aware uh, about their rights, the law, or organizations that could help them in recognizing even discrimination, 
or on the other side, because these practices of discrimination are so subtle, are institutionalized, are just happening in the way that nobody is rude to you, you just cannot come through, it's like this. And if it's not in this rude, violent way, then it's also difficult to point and say, oh, it's discrimination, I have to report it, I have to do something about it. Um, okay, I already uh, talked about uh, Slovenia a little bit, bit just to, go, uh, to, to give you this example, how enrollment of young people with immigrant background is still, they are still enrolling, for example, less demanding, less promising secondary school, uh, and socioeconomic background is here very distinctive factor. And also enrollment in preschool does not fulfill this gap, unfortunately. Um, psychologist uh, Marianica, Mar Marianovic Umek or Lucia Klun, uh, they were writing uh, about this um, also. Maybe uh, the last thing for today, yes, and then tomorrow then we will start maybe with another uh, view. Um, uh, we um, came across the question, how can then educational system together with higher education response to all these uh, issues and challenges. And one uh, idea is uh, to distinguish um, equity from equality. Maybe you know this uh, picture or maybe something similar to it because there are more versions. Uh, here uh, we see how uh, we can have different uh, ideas of what equality is. It can be this sameness, so um, giving everyone the same thing and um, uh, the same starting position. If they not need support, let's give them support, but uh, equal support, so no one gets uh, more support than the other. And then on the other hand, according to all this discussion about unequal background, uh, we can, of course, uh, discuss uh, equity. Probably in our Slavic languages, we don't have this kind of distinction uh, amongst these words like this. Uh, it's, um, it, it has to do with uh, fairness and uh, access to the same opportunities. Um, yeah, and maybe if you you would like to add something, or how do you see this um, um, these concepts? I, I would just like to add about Roma um, uh, students, Roma population. For example, in Podgorica, I think they, are, they we have school at Vrela Ribinčka where Roma uh, children are attending, but and probably they are, uh, most of them attend that school because that's where their settlement is or, or where they are uh, grouped. How uh, I think that's also the problem that maybe unintentionally we have created a, like a ghetto no or for for them and then it's uh, i think also there there would be uh, i heard i don't know some time ago that uh, there were uh, parents uh, um, uh, who were not happy when they heard that the roma child will be in the same class with, with, the, with their children and so Probably also that's the reason. If you have complaints uh, from the parents, then uh, the school will say sorry, or I don't know. I, I think it, it, uh, um, it, it's a big uh, issue here, and uh, uh, it, it's still that NGOs are um, providing the help, not the, the state. So it's uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, recently when I was watching TV, it was probably for this, uh, for the day of Roma population, some, some day that was uh, uh, celebrating something. So they were, uh, they uh, showed some positive role models. I think there was uh, uh, some young uh, um, uh, Roma person who wrote a book and I think he, um, or maybe he, he was working, uh, 
I don't know, he, he graduated from the university, etc., and he wanted to help uh, um, other Roma um, children, and uh, so, so it was all positive. And I think they need more uh, role models from, from their community um, who will, that, will, that will help. Yeah, uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's like this yeah, in all, all the countries, uh, not only Montenegro, only once a year we like have this special day and maybe we have a chance to, to hear something in the media. Uh, and, and then again, like really sporadically. Otvorila gdje smo ostali jučer, to je bila neka zadnja tema. Sad ću ovo malo kombinirati. Na engleski smo razgovarali o konceptu equity and equality. Razgovarali smo o razliki što se tiče tih pozicija iz kojih neko počinje, te početne pozicije i kako možemo na različite načine razumjeti equality, to bi bilo na crnogorski, što je prevod equality, kako bi se to prevelo, ako mi možete tu možda pomoć? Jednakost. Jednakost. Jednakost, da. Evo, tako da smo pogledali taj koncept i sad bi ja nastavila sa nekim drugim, u stvari sljedećim, koji, evo, drugi dan, koja je neka druga perspektiva. Tako da vidim, jer imam sve napisano na engleski, bi ipak zamolila da prvo to možda pročitam, objasnim i onda možda malo prediskutiramo u bilo kojem jeziku. Tako da smo možda malo fleksibilni da probamo kako to ide, to prevajanje. Tako da ću sad malo skočiti na engleski jer mi je ta baza tu i možda će mi biti malo lakše. Now I will explain uh, another perspective um, and this perspective uh, actually uh, a binary position. So on the other side is a multicultural perspective and on the other side egalitarian perspective. Uh, so this is another view than equality and equity. Uh, I want to present to you uh, more concepts, more uh, perspectives that we can find in theory. So uh, we could finally uh, discuss what is maybe relevant for us, what is important for us, uh, what can be of, of benefit when we work in practice, when we try to reflect upon our own practices within our uh, everyday lives or professional lives. Uh, so um, here is also a reference. Uh, it was a lot, a lot of research uh, done about these two principles. So I would explain each first. Uh, multicultural belief that teachers or high school teachers or any professionals or actually any person can have. Uh, this means that uh, somebody recognizes that because individuals have engaged with different social cultural contexts, they have different perspectives and beliefs. And these differences are seen as very difficult, if not impossible to ignore when we work in certain groups. So we cannot ignore that we come from different cultures, have different backgrounds, speak different languages. And as teachers or high, high school teachers, we want to consider it. We don't want to ignore it. Uh, so proponents of this multiculturalist belief um, that these intercultural differences should be embraced and they are viewed as enriching. So not as an obstacle, but, but as, as something that, uh, that gives richness to our collectives. And in the educational context or even a uh, high educational context, uh, teachers that would have multicultural beliefs, um, they, we can expect that they will incorporate students' different cultural backgrounds into everyday school practice, educational practice, 
while planning lessons, choosing materials, interacting with students. So this is the first one. And now this other one, uh, which is different actually, or is um, kind of um, the other side of this first one is called egalitarian belief. Uh, and this one on the other side emphasizes the importance of uh, treating all people equally. But here uh, I would just say uh, we can recognize the idea of equality, not equity from the first. Um, so equality, not equity, if we try to compare. Um, uh, this implies finding similarities and common grounds between students of different ethnic and cultural backgrounds, regardless their um, ethnic or cultural background. Um, here is also one concept. I'm not sure if you are familiar with it. In English, it is called a color, color blind idea, color blindness. I, I'm not sure if you are maybe familiar with it. But the idea is, um, it comes from racism. Yesterday we were talking a lot uh, also about racism. And the idea is that the best uh, approach that we can have towards uh, racial issues is like to ignore, to ignore it. Like to be blind, not to, not to give a lot of attention to it. Um, so not to, um, yeah, not to give it a bigger, bigger power uh, in a way. Um, so uh, proponents of this egalitarianism uh, often argue that categorization on the basis of ethnicity, race, culture is another source of discrimination. So if we categorize, it's actually a basis for discrimination or nationalism or racism, and we should avoid it like we should pretend like we are all equal and those differences doesn't matter. Um, yeah, um, in the educational or higher educational contexts, a professor with strong egalitarian beliefs would pay less attention to the cultural background of their students. Uh, they would focus on their similarities instead and try to search for sim what is similar, what is common, uh, seeking to treat all students equally. Uh, as a consequence, they can be expected to favor common curriculum and to give students cultural background less consideration and less, and le don't play lessons, uh, don't, don't uh, plan lessons uh, that would uh, base on this uh, differentiation. Um, before I uh, open the discussion about this, I would like also to, to say that those two beliefs are not uh, exclusive. So it doesn't mean that we have to be exclusively on one side or on the other side. No, uh, also those, um, those uh, uh, authors that write about it, uh, they say that those two beliefs are, are actually conceptually independent and a professor may hold egalitarian belief to some degree and at the same time try to accommodate cultural differences. So maybe we can switch or we can be somewhere between. Uh, and it's not, for, of course, one or the other. But those are only maybe two concepts to understand a little bit better and then to try to reflect which way is in certain situation the best for us. Um, but however, yeah, the, 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 uh, many researches uh, have been done and according to this research, the two beliefs also have different implications for practice. And uh, we can say, okay, we can see in this country teachers mostly have multicultural beliefs and somewhere else not. And then it affects how they act in their everyday practice. Um, yeah, maybe now I would really like to ask you if this makes any sense for you or if you are maybe thinking uh, where you stand uh, regarding these two, um, yeah, th these two, uh, um, yeah, ideas or views or um, if maybe you have some something you wanted to share before we go on?
Evo, mogu bih ja samo kratko nešto, sad ne znam da li sam najbolje ovo i pohvatala i ostalo, vrlo je zanimljivo jer ja kažem, mi radimo sa studentima, ja sam u biblioteci sa studentima svih fakulteta, tako da, s obzirom da je Crna Gora baš multikulturalna država, imamo studente koji koji su došli tipa iz Ulcinja i koji imaju maternji jezik albanski. Imamo studente naše ovdje, imamo studente koji ne mogu da čitaju latinicu, koji ne mogu da čitaju čirilicu, nego traže latinicu ili tako nešto. Ali baš ovo mi je vrlo zanimljivo. Ja bi ovako kao običan čovjek rekla, dobro, ajmo, svi ćemo zajedno i nema izjedračavanja, nego prema svakome isto. Međutim, sad kad ovo vidim, malo sam onda zbunjena. Sad uopšte ne mogu da se odredi da li je bolje da budemo multikulturalni ili da budemo prema svima jednaki. A nisam colorblind, znači baš gledam da im izađem u susret u toj najvećoj mjeri koja može, što se tiče, pričam sa svojeg stanovišta knjiga, te drugačije je vjerojatno odnos profesora i ostalo ga je rade na nekom drugom nivou nego ja. Ali vrlo je zanimljivo za razmišljanje uopšte šta je za tu djecu bolje. Ako gledamo, sad nemam neko iskustvo lično, bez ovako sa televizije ili slično, tipa kakve su škole u Americi ili dobro živjela sam u Londonu pa tamo nekako ta mješovitost opet je drugačija. Opet je negdje svu gdje se gleda taj civilni dio, a ta kultura, njihova kultura, oni to negdje u drugom nekom segmentu, možda i to sa onim jednakim uniformama i slično, jer, na primjer, one obuku uniforme, ja sam konkretno živjela među Induse i dan da nas sam s njima, čak sam se i ja oblačila kao Indusa, ću joj kažem da oni se obuku u tradicionalno, pa odu u školu, pa su u školu svi jednake. E sad, vjerojatno imaju neke dane, nisam stvarno išla tako od boku, imaju neke dane kada oni prikazuju te neke svoje, ali što se tiče školskog programa i toga što oni imaju u školi, mislim da je on za sve jednak. Ali evo, informisat ću se, svakako vrlo mi je zanimljivo, to sam samo htjela da kažem. Mnogo je tih segmenata o kojima čovjek ovako i ne razmišlja, a one postoje, mislim i istraživanja i pogledam kad gledam ove godine 2002. 2004. koliko se tu nekakvih gradacija napravilo u tim mi ovdje doživljavamo nešto kao rasizam ili nešto gdje nekoga direktno s nečim vrijeđamo, ali ako ga ne vrijeđaš, nego samo ga izjednačavaš sa ostalima, sad shvatam da je i to neka vrsta ne tam, evo bit će zanimljivo. Hvala Tamara, vrlo interesantan feedback i od ovoga samoga početka što ste podelila kako kao u biblioteci, mislim što sve, sa kakvom različitom, što sve postoji u smislu različitosti, latinica, čirilica, različiti jezici i tek onda možda još neki neki studenti koji dolaze iz drugih država, recimo. Već ta unutrašnja je izazov i ti uvidi koje ste ispostavila. Možda još neki feedback? Ja samo da kažem, mislim, ja sam od nedavno sa studentima radim, tako da nemam sad neko iskuso veliko da podijelim, ali Ja mogu samo da kažem da, na primjer, kad ih upoznajem, pitam ih uvijek odakle dolaze, na primjer, prva godina, jer mislim da je to bitno, nemaju svi jednako znanje, predznanje koje je potrebno, tako da onda gledam da prilagodim ta predavanja svima. Znači da i onaj ko je došao sa manje znanje bude uključen i shvati materiju. I kod nas, ja nisam primijetila, mislim, zato što su i mala, možda mali, ovo gdje ja predajem, male su grupe i mislim da su svi bili koherentni. Samo su se, znači, razlikovali po tom nekom nivou znanja, bar nisam 
Evo, Tamara ima više iskustva i, i više studenata kod nje dolazi čitav, čitav, čitav univerzitet. <laughs> Tako da onda tu ima više e, mogućnosti da se sretnu ovi različiti multikulturalni e, slučajevi. Pa ja mm. sad nisam. Hvala. Da, isto um, bi možda, možda to ispostavila a, dok smo u nekim a, manjim grupama i još nemamo dosta nekih slučajeva, slu, slučajeva o kojima treba razmišljati, je na, naravno lakše prilagođavati, tražiti neke individualne a, puteve. A, a kad je to više masovno, onda naravno imamo tendenciju da sve nekako standardiziramo, da nam bude lakše. I već ako što je institucija ili neki sistem, već je ta tendencija da kažemo za sve treba da bude jednako, ne možemo raditi nekih um, um, exceptions, uh, ne možemo, ne možemo, da, uh, jer, jer bi to, ne, kako, 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 kako to, ne, uh, tako da je ta individualizacija sa druge strane uh, jedna uh, vrlo uh, važna realnost um, um, modern, modernog društva, i na svim područjima je ta tendenca da trebamo individualizirati svoje pristupe bez obzira ili uh, u smislu jezika, uh, kulture ili možda nekih drugih potreba ko neko ima. A to sam još htjela možda samo dodati u različitim državama, uh, krajevima, kulturama naravno su više ispostavljeni različiti odnosi prema tome Um, na, u nekom opštom smi, opštem smislu, recimo, um, ne, ne znam, Sjedinjene države, um, možda ta ideja da je neka etničnost ili neka nacionalnost stvar koja se u uh, privatnom segmentu um, realizira, a u javnom je ta ideja da svi kao na, na neki isti način, da to nema, nema mjesta u nekom javnom segmentu, Uh, i, ili možda francuska isto ta ideja, ta jaka ideja colorblindness. Uh, I možda u nekim drugim uh, dijelovima, možda i našim, je to ne, neki mix tih pristupa. Na različitim područjima radimo različito. Samo još jedno iskustvo bi podelila, u stvari um, um, istraživanje. U Sloveniji smo, je kolegica istraživala kako učitelji um, razumu problematiko romske djece u školi. I što se je jako ispostavilo, uh, je bilo, uh, to je bilo ono najjače što smo, što smo doznali, uh, da uh, oni interpretiraju uh, sve izazove koji imaju sa romskom djecom kao da su stvar um, njihove različitosti. Um, samo ispostavljaju čemu nisu, u čemu su različiti, u čemu, u čemu su drugačiji. A nikako ne, ne ispostavljaju um, te neke egalitarnosti ili uh, po čemu su slični, što je zajedničko. I to traženje zajedničkog, što ispostavlja egalitarni pristup, je ipak, ipak u, slučajevima, u slučajevima kao je taj važno, jer nam pomaže da nađemo neka skupna, um, um, ne, neki starting point, ne, ne, neke, neke zajedničke, Nešto što, im, što nam je zajedničko. Mislim da ste juče kolegica uh, Radenka, ako uh, se dobro sjećam da ste podelila to iskustvo uh, kako ste u Belgiji um, imala uh, taj um, tečaj uh, kad ste došla. To, je, to mi je činilo da je, uh, da je bio tak, takav pristup. Svi ste bili pozvani i ideja je bila da se sad za sve to organizira iz početka i onda se na, naravno diferencira, jer ste, neki su bili nepismeni, neki su bili na nekoj drugoj ravni, tako da je možda bilo vidno kako jedno i drugo tamo um, uh, koeksistira na neki način. Dobro, uh, samo trenutak. Um, aha, 
Evo, izvinjavam se. Mislim da se nam je priključio naš kolega Abišak koji ne razumije crnogorski, tako da ću ja preklopit. Hello, Abišak. We will switch to English. Um, and maybe if so someone uh, would be more comfortable with uh, Montenegrin, I can also translate for you, but I will try to, uh, to um, uh, speak in English uh, from now on. Welcome. And I hope it was not too confusing. Uh, probably you were here for a few minutes and uh, <laughs> yeah, asking yourself what's going on. Okay. It's all right, ma'am, you can continue. Okay, yeah, we were talking about uh, two approaches, two perspectives, multicultural versus egalitarian. And now uh, I will continue. Uh, yes, here I, I will, uh, Katya will send you all this if you will be interesting in more, interested in more. Um, here are a few articles and also research. And you can also see um, a questionnaire uh, which is used for um, defining what kind of beliefs teacher or high educational teacher have, multicultural or egalitarian. Um, okay. Uh -huh. uh, now, again, maybe a more specific things that we will, we will see if we, we will all understand because they are kind of cultural specific. What I share here, so I would like now to, to talk further about, um, I called it dozing of otherness. I hope the, uh, the term is correct, doziranje. Uh, I meant um, controlling. Um, and I wanted to, to talk about it, how in certain aspects, of course, uh, we appreciate uh, difference and we say, oh, it's really enriching and we want to see the difference. But I would like to, to speak now also about limits, uh, because we have to be aware of those limits and to consider those limits so that we can somehow also transcend them if we want. OK, I choose one graffiti uh, in Ljubljana. Uh, I'm curious if, if it would be uh, understandable for you. In Slovenian language, it says burek bi džamije pane. And this would mean in translation, like you would like to have burek. Burek is a pie. Uh, it's um, a typical food that comes from Turkey, basically, I think, but is also very, very common in a region of former Yugoslavia, in Bosnia especially, but I think also in Montenegro. Uh, maybe you call it differently, not burek, or maybe pita, I'm not sure, a burek. And in Slovenia, it's also very, very common, but of course it's not traditional Slovenian, but it's still so common that sometimes if uh, you would ask young people what is typical Slovenian food, maybe they would mistaken and say burek because it's available 24 seven. And sometimes we make jokes if they go to Erasmus exchange somewhere and then they said, oh, now traditional Slovenian food and probably they would, they would make burek. So it's, you know, it's a little bit, and it's also funny, one anthropologist uh, made a PhD about burek. Your uh, name Likus, my colleague here in Slovenia, and just for a joke, then he, he called himself, he gave uh, himself nickname, Dr. Burek. <laughs> so Burek is a big, big uh, topic in, in Slovenia. Uh, but yeah, this is like um, talking about how this is very generally accepted as a food that is basically not from Slovenia and also people that are selling it and making it are usually economic immigrants. Um, yeah, they, they are not from Slovenia, um, but yeah, uh, so you would have a burek, but not a mosque, because it was years ago uh, when in Slovenia there was no uh, one single mosque. Now in recent years, uh, we got one, first one in Ljubljana, but it was of course big public debate about it, and also probably this graffiti what was somehow part of this debate. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of it, 
but it's interesting that uh, this graffiti is now uh, also a part of the permanent collection of the Ethnographic Museum of Ljubljana. So if you go to the exhibition, uh, exhibition about living in our contemporary society, you could also see this graffiti amongst the, yeah, the other works. So uh, the idea that I wanted to develop uh, out of this um, Bulek topic is how, of course, on certain fields we acknowledge otherness, but on, uh, but on the other side, we want to control it or we don't want to go deeper. Uh, we, could, uh, we could make analogy with spicy food, maybe. Uh, so we like uh, to try um, uh, food from other parts of the world. Uh, it's exotic for us and we, we really like to go to other restaurants. I don't know, in Slovenia, Mexican, Indian, of course, um, uh, also Chinese and so on. Uh, but uh, these tastes have to be uh, accommodated for our, our taste. So it, if it would be uh, so spicy as, for example, in the country it, it's coming from, it wouldn't be acceptable. Probably this idea, this metaphor, uh, we, can, we can also um, apply when we are thinking about other aspects of culture, not food, uh, spiciness, but maybe other aspects. Um, here uh, I want to present or to share with you another idea or, an, or also a concept, uh, corporative multiculturalism. Uh, it's uh, very, in a way, funny that uh, the other name of it became Benetton effect. I would just briefly share with you, um, or maybe not because it would be also already a commercial, but probably you, you know what I'm talking about, you noticed uh, Benetton commercials, uh, uh, their idea is like to be a kind of provocative in this way, uh, dealing with difference, uh, different colors, different gender, um, uh, different uh, cultural, um, uh, yeah, different cultures and so on, uh, showing uh, in a way like we are all equal, uh, but on the other side, maybe we could also say, if we would go deeper into it, that it's on artificial level, because yeah, but we are still all um, rich and beautiful and um, yeah, like uh, we, we, we live very well. On the other side, we are all yeah equal, but not really different. So you are not showing us real differences you are just showing this uh, superficial um, superficial or uh, even we could say carnivalic um, differences that we can see. But you, you don't go deeper into questioning why then uh, there are struggles, there are conflicts and so on. Okay, so here is a link, but uh, maybe I'm not gonna open it. You can maybe uh, check uh, after. Uh-huh. We have another participant coming. Uh, and I, I also wanted to, to ask a question, are ideas of interculturalism in higher education sometimes also limited by this concept of corporative multiculturalism? Uh, for example, when we come together, uh, have e events, uh, multicultural events, um, presentations, we usually stay on this level. We share food, music, um, and we don't want to go deeper. We stay together for two hours and we said it's a carnival, it's fine. Or maybe the other uh, example would be uh, something that we mentioned uh, already yesterday, um, how we present minorities in certain, in certain countries. For example, we have one day um, also in Slovenia, it's International Day of Roma. And this international day, then uh, we have to dedicate maybe a few minutes in the news, what's going on, invite somebody also from Roma community, but probably this person uh, will have the only chance on this day to present himself or his or her community uh, in the media, the only few minutes, uh, other days like they don't exist. So it would be also 
uh, maybe a good example. Um, okay, uh, before I go on, maybe you have a question or idea or um, uh, something that is not very clear for you so far? Uh, Ma'am, I yes. want to know a little, little more about Roma community you are talking about. Can you tell me a little more about Roma community? Yes. Uh, yes, of course. Um, I have also prepared like an a, additional part, but I said that probably we will not have time. Yeah, so Roma community is uh, actually one of the largest uh, minorities in uh, Europe. Uh, here I have some data, but you know, these data are... Uh, are not really, really 100% because statistics about Roma community are not 100% because people don't, you know, go and report themselves or declare themselves as Roma. So Abhishek, please, you have to uh, take it with, uh, you know, uh, in, in, this, in this regard. Okay, but the numbers that I have, that like 3 million, about 3 million people um, in uh, Europe uh, is like uh, speaking uh, Roma, Roman language. Maybe it would be uh, interesting to know for you that in Second World War, they were also victims of genocide. So not only Jewish people, not only Slavic people, but also Roma. Uh, at least uh, 600,000. Roma people were killed, and we don't know much about it, but there is a word in Roma language, parayamos, for this genocide. Um, and yeah, it's like also the most spread minority in Europe. Um, one of the idea is that uh, their roots are from India, but like it's a lot, a lot of it is like lost on the way because there is not a lot of written history about Roma community, about Roma minority. Uh, and uh, when they were traveling as nomad people uh, to these parts, to Balkan, uh, they were like settling in different parts on this way and also took uh, language from those those parts where they were staying. But Ma'am, are, are the people from Romania? Are they Romanian people? Uh, no, uh, no. In Romania, there are many Roman people, but they are not Romanian. In Romania, Roma community lives, yes. But it's not the same. It's not the same. But maybe what is important to say, they don't have their own country. Uh, so they are minorities or out of town minority or just minority. And I think that uh, we couldn't say that in any of European countries, although they don't just live in European countries, but all over the world, maybe also other similar uh, groups like travelers and so on. Um, but we could say that huh, probably we don't have really good, good example of uh, living together with other parts of society. Uh, it's really a bad example of inclusion or failure for, for the most of uh, our communities. Uh, and if I speak for former Yugoslavia, we could say that in socialism, we didn't find a good solution. And now in uh, another system, we can't find it. So somehow, um, yeah. Yeah, but we are mentioning because it's probably um, a minority par excellence in our, our uh, countries. Maybe other colleagues would like to add something? What is important to know? Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, what I want to say that in Montenegro, mm -hmm. uh, they are included uh, in uh, uh, primary schools, uh, so they have to go to school because we got, uh, especially here in Podgorica, it's uh, one big part of the town where uh, Ro Roman people uh, come and settle down there. Uh, we got uh, our, uh, uh, how to say, uh, 
is one from Montenegro and uh, during the wars uh, and uh, all the situation all over the this uh, part of the Europe, uh, there were so many uh, who came to Podgorica and stay there. And uh, our government made for them uh, buildings, not our government, uh, with support of uh, European Union. Uh, they uh, uh, built the buildings for them, uh, they got apartments there, they have to be, uh, how to say, um, signed, uh, because what you uh, already said, Stella, there is no uh, data about them. So when they come to Montenegro, they have to go to the, uh, I, we call it police office, but it is not, this is like green office, you know, when they uh, got uh, some paper and everything, and they kid because the primary education in Podgorica is uh, um, Raden Kakakuskaja Obavezan, mandatory. Yep, it's mandatory. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they have to go to school uh, for the, uh, from the first to the ninth. That's been from the uh, sixth year uh, until uh, uh, 13 or 15 years, I think, because it's nine year uh, primary school in, uh, in uh, Montenegro. So uh, they go, together with our uh, children, of course, they are not, uh, even in that part, there is a lot of them, of Podgorica, they go together with school and uh, their parents are uh, uh, including, uh, if they want, they can work, uh, but mostly that part is that they work in, uh, in uh, how to say, uh, uh, Rubbish, rubbish collectors, no? Yeah, okay, like that. <laughs> I, I try to find the proper word. And we got on TV, uh, not just for uh, their day, uh, we got, um, uh, I think, one uh, a week on the uh, government TV. They got the uh, program, uh, which... Uh, which is on their language and everything. And they are good anyway because they live together with our people. So we know all that music, all that rhythm, everything what is really, really interesting. So uh, before it was like, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't uh, regular like that properly, but uh, now uh, they're trying to, they're trying really hard to include, to be a part of uh, our community. They are more visible. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Abhishek, does it um, sounds um, understandable for you? Can yeah. You yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I. I, yeah. I got. And maybe uh, also one thing that is really obvious, uh, maybe for us, like Radinka Tamara and other colleagues, but maybe interesting to say. Um, uh, Roman language uh, is not uh, included in uh, school programs, not in Slovenia and not in Montenegro. And uh, if I have correct information, uh, in uh, any other country. So we are al always, you know, talking about how to include them in school and we fail on and on, but um, never uh, in really, you know, um, school is not including, you know, on the other side. So we will talk later about this mutual inclusion so not just interaction but yeah really. is it are there uh do you do you have in slovenia teachers who can speak roman language or uh, yeah you know we actually we are like not halfway there but one good practice exists and this practice are uh roma um assistants roma assistants in certain schools only there where there are really uh, a, a, a large Roma community. And it's like people from Roma community that are not uh, educated teachers because there are obstacles, you know, like we were talking yesterday, they don't come to study, but still uh, educated um, to, to uh, work as Roma assistant, which is kind of a bridging position, you know, one like, to try to be kind of a bridge for these pupils to communicate easy, easier. Um, uh -huh. Oops, sorry. Uh -huh. uh, so 
not yeah so uh, it's possible and uh, when for example when uh, we would um, show we need them you know there, there would be more and more of course and maybe we could give a scholarship so it would be possible but probably there the problem uh not the problem but probably there there should be some kind of a program that will uh, instruct parents why is that good that children go to school because it's always a parent who will decide if the child will go to school or not not the child i think at the end and uh, and the, the, it's not i think only in our countries is is uh, there are uh, other problems i just now remember i watched yesterday the um, Italian Rayuno, and there were news about a girl that was killed by probably their familiars, and they were not allowing her. I think she was from Pakistan or something. So uh, uh, she was not allowed to go to university. And uh, it, it's really, um, I think it's the parents that, that uh, we, not we, <laughs> but I don't know who should talk to and uh, give them this other perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe it's not the topic, but I just want to mention one thing uh, which uh, we do here in Montenegro because we got uh, that situation that uh, parents, uh, it's not cell, but it is like cell, um, girls who are under uh, 18 years, actually they are 13 years or 14 years, so they don't have any kind of uh, uh, way to make decision of their, their life and they just sell it to somebody who is so there there is a big program in Montenegro to stop that and I think that they are uh, uh, I don't have a, it's just uh, taken from the news so I'm not including that uh, I don't have a proper data or something but I know that, that there is a really good uh, project and the uh, uh, and uh, it is led by uh, uh, Roma's uh, woman. Mm -hmm. It is led by them. So it is supported by the United uh, uh, European Union and the uh, Montenegro government. But it is led because they they started with that that, they, that should be stopped. To uh, it's not maybe by money. It's not sell by money, but it is sell. Uh, I don't know, for some kind of uh, uh, so it, it is really it's really really terrible to see that it's they're just a girl and they don't have uh, any kind uh, of uh, support of their family and it, it's really really sad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, maybe just just to share um, just a little bit. Um, I'm also working uh, with uh, certain families of uh, Roma community here in Ljubljana, but in Ljubljana we don't have like big big uh, community, uh, but more um, migrants from poor former Yugoslav republics that are settled, you know, uh, here. So the story is a little bit different. And I would like to share that uh, one big issue, of, of course, parents, as uh, you, you mentioned, but it's also this segregation, um, uh, how community lives segregated. Um, and yes, on the other hand, okay, community can be helpful and maybe it's the only means of social capital that they have. But on the other side, it can be also very, very oppressive, for example, to the young girls um, and uh, it's so difficult then for this uh, state, for, for the community, for our institution to conquer this community or, you know, to offer something. So one good way is maybe really to offer apartments, uh, which would be um, um, not like, again, uh, segregated on only one place, but uh, on on uh, uh, like different places, uh, so if family wants, they can move. In here in Slovenia, it's good practice. They move, uh, for example, in public uh, apartment, and then uh, we are giving them support. One NGO that I also am connected to it, and also I work with students to support them. Of course, this uh, 
they lack this community support, but it's okay if they have maybe some other support. And we also meet these kind of situations. For example, um, their tendency to marry their children when they are minors. But it's easier to negotiate if it's only one family and we are here, you know, we had such situation that family really said, oh, our son is already 16 and he's single. We have to get a, a wife for her. And then they actually kind of, yeah, organized a girl from Bosnia came to Slovenia and we were like, all well, you know, uh, like, yeah, what, what to do now? But I can say that with the negotiation, somehow, okay, we managed. Maybe it was not easy and it was also for us difficult to see how important it is for them. Um, but then, yeah, she, she was here for some time and then she went back. <laughs> and maybe next time they will realize that, uh, oh, it's really not um, allowed uh, and so on. So I just wanted to say that it's really, of course, it's easier to, to negotiate it's, if it's one family and people that really support them. If it's whole community and segregated living without uh, infrastructure in you know, really bad um, conditions, then we don't have much, um, <laughs> We don't have a good position to negotiate to or to 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 come to dialogue with them. Maybe this is also one thing. Then, of course, uh, with parents. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm really glad that we touched this subject uh, because I think that actually we already opened this next picture I wanted to show. We did it somehow spontaneously. So Abhishek, thank you for your question about Roma community. Uh, because uh, from, from here on, uh, I wanted to speak also a little bit about, yeah, it's a concept or metaphor of cultural iceberg. So Ledena um, Gora uh, iceberg, which is metaphor used very, very often for a lot of things, right? And also for these cultural issues. Uh, why I said that it's connected with our discussion that we just had, because we touched uh, these issues that are under the surface. Uh, before, we were more um, focusing on the language, food, uh, festivals, music, dance, and uh, things that are on the surface that we can see, that we can share in our, in, on our festivals, on the media. But now when we started to, to talk and to problematize, uh, we touched um, certain issues um, that are kind of deeper. For example, uh, the attitude uh, towards um, gender uh, or uh, ideas what childhood means ideas what a transition to, to adulthood means. Um, re uh, relations to, I don't know, to violence, um, par par parental roles, ideas that we have and that we think we share and are really important for us. And maybe um, without, um, without problematizing, we think, okay, we share those values. Well, we have the same ideas of what is fair, uh, what is good in the gender relations um, regarding health, regarding sexuality, regarding taking care of children. But if we go a little bit deeper, of course, it's not like this. Under the surface, uh, like there are many important components of cultures, ideas, preferences, priorities, values that maybe we don't share. And if I try to, to, to give you example, but I think you already know uh, what I want to say, when I interact with this Roma community, of course, I also have to question my own beliefs. For example, importance of education. Um, it's so strong in our cultures. And then when, when I talk with parents uh, of Roma family and then they say, oh, no, uh, why, uh, why, you know, um, 
it's enough of education for him. It's better for him to stay at home and to learn something. Uh, he didn't learn anything at school. I think it's better for him to do something practical now. It's a waste of time. It's difficult to hear, but it's somehow their experience uh, from his generation and past generation and also this generation now. And not only that, of course, I, I become angry and try to argue, oh no, but what can he do without education in life? On the other side, I, of course, I also question my beliefs, <laughs> my, my statements, our common values, um, and understand in a way why this function like this in, in other, um, in maybe in their family. Uh, so the idea of this cultural iceberg uh, is uh, actually to, to make us uh, think about how everything seems fine, about multicultural uh, um, relations, as long as we stay uh, under uh, the surface. And we say, okay, we tolerate, we can tolerate. Uh, later on, I will talk a little bit more about toleration. And I would just like to remind you that in our languages, uh, Slavic languages, and also, of course, this uh, word, toleration, ni uh, kažemo strpnost. Kako se kaže u nacrnogorskom? Isto? Strpljenje. Strpljenje, aha. Strpljenje ili tolerancije. Pretpostavljam to na engleskom, što ste rekli, ali... Da, hvala. Strpljenje. Strpljenje. Jer je interesantno da se ta riječ trpeti, se kao trpeti, nešto trebamo da, u stvari trebamo da trpimo. Like in English, for a bit like suffer, or yeah, suffer, yeah, in a way. So we have to, somehow we know we have to live with them, but they are others. We will never consider them as us. We will say oni, we will say them. When, when we will talk spontaneously about Roma community or any other, we will spontaneously start to talk oni, oni, me oni. Uh, uh, we have to, uh, yeah, we, we have to suffer to live together with, him, with them. We know we have to because this, um, this is the reality that we are different, but of course, it's not the best, but if we are mature enough and politically uh, correct, that we will do it. So it's one aspect of it. Uh, and of course, uh, without uh, considering also these deeper parts, uh, discussing them, thinking about them, and even reflect our own um, um, uh, values or points we start or things we believe and we think they are universal, it's difficult actually to go to interactions because this is probably a big discussion, but huh, what is really universal? For example, yeah, of course, uh, when they are 16, we, we consider them as children. And we, when they are 18, formally, they're adults. But in our cultures, we still consider 18 years like, oh, no, it's too early to have their own family. But if we would go maybe uh, 15, the hundred years in the past, also in our cultures, it would be completely different. Uh, but yeah, we, we somehow adopt it to what is going on in our society, prolonging of, for example, this transition period. And now this is normal for us. Uh, but maybe it's really not universally normal or it's not functional for all the parts of society and so on. But of course, when it comes to uh, rights and to this issue of like, legal rights, yeah, of course we know uh, what we have to stick to. But it's not only about rights and about law, it's also about beliefs beneath. Um, I would uh, also like to, to tell you that uh, there are many forms of this cultural iceberg you can, you can find if you maybe uh, Google or something. 
and um, uh, they they emphasize different aspects. So I picked one. Uh, just it's, here is very obvious how the surface are the things that we we would maybe name first when we talk about culture, and the deeper there are many many other deeper structural things, concepts, ideas, attitudes. For example, attitude towards um, elderly people, or death, or age, or approaches to religion, marriage, and so on. Um, maybe would you like to add something or ask something else maybe about this uh, part? Here, uh, just to, to share with you another poem, this is in Slovenian, and here is only one refer also one reference, just that you can see that there are different forms. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I'm not sure where, the, where it's coming from. I was trying to find out. But there are so many references that I think it's already something really like common idea uh, used for different purposes. Um, it can be used for discussion uh, about, for example, sometimes I would do it in pairs with students, like to look, to take a look at it and then to make a discussion how these differences uh, help or doesn't help us, uh, don't help us to, to communicate, to cooperate uh, and things that we open also now in our, our discussion. Okay, uh, do you have uh, energy to open one more topic? Uh, maybe before going to the break, is it okay for you? Another one um, uh, about prejudice? I hope it's, it's not too much, maybe another half an hour and then uh, we will see uh, how to go on. Okay, so yes, uh, here I, I shared again one um, poster. And here you have a references, a reference, one, one of references, um, because uh, I mentioned already yesterday, there was an exhibition also in Ljubljana where I had the chance to, to see it uh, with the name, The Faces of Racism Revealed, with all those posters um, discussing racism in this more, more institutionalized manner. Uh, and then I was trying to get a reference and here is just one because this, uh, this exhibition was then traveling and this is from Warsaw. Also other posters are mainly from this same concept. So also this one where we can see uh, it's very depressing to live in a time where it's easier to break an atom than a prejudice. And they say that uh, Albert Einstein, Einstein uh, said this. So it, it's his quote, and it's really interesting that, of course, it was not <laughs> now, <laughs> but in his time. And yeah, he had reasons as a member of a Jew community and maybe in some other, some other manners like a minority to, to reflect upon it. Um, and this is just the begin for the beginning or to enter into the uh -huh, camera is coming to um, to the next topic about um, about prejudice. Uh, just a second, please. Mm -hmm. okay. Welcome, Tamara. Uh -huh, here I have it. Yes. Okay, uh, so um, uh, first, maybe one more note. Uh, yesterday, we, uh, we, uh, I explained already when we were mentioning racism, nationalism, ethnocentrism, also discrimination or prejudice. Uh, all those processes or all those phenomena are of course phenomena uh, that we, we could uh, divide and uh, define separately. But for our purposes, uh, we, will, we will take what is common to all these phenomena. So also now in this part, uh, when I will explain something about prejudice, 
uh, we could also put the word racism uh, or discrimination or nationalism uh, on, the, on the place of where prejudice is. And it would be actually the same meaning. Okay, so uh, I will um, um, I will use uh, one uh, article of one Slovenian author, Mirjana Ule, uh, to share. And like I, I hope I uh, translate it well because it was Slovenian article. And I will also give you a link. Uh, in this article, she's explaining a changing nature nature of prejudice in contemporary, or she said, modern uh, society. And she's defining uh, two different forms. I will explain um, further. So one, uh, we could say blatant. It would mean uh, loud, uh, explicit, so obvious. Uh, in Slovenian language, uh, the word is kričavi. It means that it's shouting. Um, so I, I'm not sure what would be in Montenegrin language the, the, the best uh, translation for it. When something is really obvious and you like, you can shout about like, um, I'm not sure. Tamara, nisam vas čula. Tamara, kako? We are both Tamara in the same office. <laughs> we are together, just across each other. <laughs> A ste, ste nešto, ste imala predlog, kako bi... Uh, vi kati. Vi, da, 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 kao da... da. Kličat vi kati, da, na glas, da. jel tako nešto? Tako. Shouting, oh. shouting, uh, u, privlačiti pažnju vikom. Da, da, tako. Tako, nešto što je glasno, um, što je glasno i što je očito, što se ne pokušava da se sakrije u tom smislu. Uh, tako da, so I found this translation in her abstract blatant, so explicit, and on the other side, um, she's defining or uh, trying to, to, uh, to define what is happening in contemporary society, where, of course, it's not appropriate to uh, so uh, explicitly uh, express prejudice or maybe um, some hate feelings or discrimination. And she's trying to explain how it's still happening, but on more subtle way, in implicit way. Uh, but first, maybe just to give you a short introduction, uh, her idea is, and here is also one quote of Miriam Naule, that great ideological stories topics as nationalism, racism, and so on, they live in a variety variety of everyday particular micro-ideologies. It's a little bit complicated maybe in this, in this sentence, but she's trying to explain, or I'm also trying to explain, uh, how uh, big ideologies are finding way to our everyday life, uh, and they act through us somehow. In everyday encounters, of course, ideologies are something abstract, but they can come through only through those everyday interactions. Um, like I say here, uh, prejudice are based on ideologies, but they, they take part in everyday world ideologies that support inequality, dominance, subordination. They are translated not in the direct sense, translated into sphere of everyday life, where they act through our actions and our intergroup relation. So when we analyze our intergroup relation or our actions, when we meet people from another groups, we actually analyze also those huge ideologies. This is what now we are trying to uh, take a look, look at. Um, okay, and uh, further on, um, we would say with Miriam Naule that modern or let's say contemporary uh, forms of prejudice are like, I, I said traditional, maybe this is not the best translation here, but something from the past, something that we can know from the past. Uh, and uh, we uh, expressed our prejudice um, or just uh, our attitudes to other groups, to minorities, 
on explicit, also violent, hateful, blatant manner. So it was maybe okay to say loudly um, and uh, not to hide, but uh, in contemporary society, uh, prejudices are not sets of violent uh, uh, phrases, for example, about others. Um, Miriam Naulet says uh, they are more argumentative strategies, uh, they are rationalized. So we rationalize them, we try to explain, and we, we think we know why with our rational parts, and they are uh, legitimized broadly. So we think it's just true, it's like this. It's not only our feeling, our strong feeling, but it is something common. Um, and uh, also one important thing uh, that is here uh, also written, uh, contemporary pre prejudice uh, support status quo in given society. This is their function, so that everything stays like it is. Power relation, they will stay like it is, so we have to conserve um, the society that we have, and we, we have to avoid that something important would change especially in means of that maybe other group would gain power or would gain um, possibility to enter in the institutions where only uh, we are now ruling somehow. So um, this modern, or I would maybe rather say contemporary form of uh, prejudice are uh, implicit, um, are uh, silent. Um, one sentence, that is really, really um, um, snatch, I, know, I don't find the word, like, like this sentence uh, with which we can really understand the meaning of this kind of prejudice is, <clears throat> I don't have nothing against them, but, so maybe it sounds familiar, uh, in Slovenian language it would be, and if we talk about LGBT community, uh, I don't have nothing against them, but of course they are, they, they are not, it's not okay if they have families or if they have children, or um, I, I don't have anything against um, uh, people from Middle East, but I don't want them to come to Europe massively. But, or for example, I don't have anything uh, against Roma people, but of course I don't want them to be my neighbors. Or we have this example yesterday, and I think it was very general, not only from your um, environment. Uh, for example, oh, I have uh, nothing against this uh, migrant community or Roma community, but I don't want uh, my children to share the same school with them. So if they are on this school, that, then we will move on another school because I just want the best school, but I don't have anything against them. Uh, so Miriam Naule recognizes, yes, and also other uh, theoricians, uh, this sentence as very symptomatic, we could say. Uh, on the first place, we want to show that we are politically correct and that we are, of course, not racist and not have uh, prejudice in the sense that we, we judge without knowing what we are talking about. But there is but, of course. And this is our condition. Okay, we will let them in, but if they cannot fulfill this condition, not. We tolerate, but not too close. Now, maybe I'm uh, talking as this is something bad or something we should be ashamed of or something like this. But on the other hand, I would like to say that what we are talking about is really something general. We cannot avoid it 100%. Uh, maybe we can be aware of it, but of course we cannot imagine the society without something like this, categorization, prejudice, and so on. Of course, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's our goal to combat it, to um, deal with it somehow, but I'm not saying that um, some people are free in this sense, for example, or that it's possible to be uh, out of these um, concepts. 
uh, uh, related to this, uh, the, here is another, um, um, uh, and yeah, another another um, term. Um, I don't know if you maybe know it in another another words in your uh, language or languages. Um, we call it like in English, and we don't translate it. Uh, NIMBY effect, uh, and this is like for it stays for not in my bag uh, uh, backyard. Sorry, I have to. I will uh, correct it. Here, uh, I was <laughs> doing it very uh, quickly, so I, I have to correct it, sorry. Maybe I will do it now. Um, sorry, just a second. Not in my backyard. Is it, uh, does it sound uh, familiar to you? Backyard. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Now. Uh, do you have something similar in your language to this? So uh, it means. Backyard. Da, mera, a imate uh, možda uh, imate neku frazu da, da. Uh, za to dvorištu. Da, ne u mom dvorištu, misli se ne u mojoj blizini. Znači, da. neka postoji, ali što dalje od mene? Da, uh, da. In our language. Mm -hmm. uh, kad govorimo o, o, o toj uh, drugojakosti, koja nam, ko, ne, which we doesn't, which we, which we don't uh, support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, be mm -hmm. present, but away from me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my backyard. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Tamara. Tamara, and uh, um, uh, for example, if you could think about it, uh, what would be the group in your environment that it refers to most often? Mislim, na koju grupu se to najčešće odnosi u vašoj okolini? Ako je to... Uh, it depends on person. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are tolerant and very open. Uh, and and uh, open to other people, no matter, uh, no matter from which uh, group, uh, race, uh, nationality uh, uh, comes from, but uh, others are, uh, it depends on person. It depends on, on okay. behavior, on, uh, um, on life uh, of that person. Many factors are, are here. So mm -hmm. maybe we can say, uh, about violent people and and so on, but I suppose that no one can support that kind of behavior. But um, as far as I'm concerned, just that violent, violent, and not in my backyard, away from me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also, when we talk about race, about about nationality. There are also people who uh, does, don't support uh, uh, people who are different from, from them in, in many aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, maybe I, I can add to, the, yes, uh, to this yes. question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm coming from maritime uh, faculty mm -hmm. and it is very obvious in uh, small teams like uh, crew members on board. Um, I'm also a teacher uh, and a training coordinator for leadership and teamwork on board. And a lot of seafarers uh, have uh, trainings at our institution and they um, uh, explain mm -hmm. us their experiences uh, gained through different multicultural uh, crews. Uh, they said that uh, what is the most interesting that they um, accept other people, let's say Chinese culture, Indians, uh, Ukrainians, uh, but um, what, what is interesting that when they are in a group which is similar to their family background and family mindset and cultural mindset, let's say like 
uh, Montenegrins only in the crew or Montenegrins and uh, um, uh, crew from Adriatic Sea, they have problems to share uh, maybe some personal uh, tasks or there is a lot of uh, prejudice uh, caused by previous time in our, uh, in, in our region. So uh, sometimes they rather accept more different uh, persons that may be persons uh, that are originally from Montenegro or uh, region, regional countries. That is very interesting to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and also about this uh, Dvorište or our, uh, our backyard. Mm -hmm. It is also very interesting to say that sometimes uh, in traditional families, uh, maybe or the northern part of our country in in very very traditional families still uh, there is um, a traditional mindset uh, not open let's say when um, uh, when um, there is a, uh, a couple and if the if uh, male and female are not as family um, uh, how to say, suppose that they should be behave. Sometimes it could be very interesting to see different mental models. Also uh, in the small in the small country as Montenegro is, let's say northern part, central part and southern part. I came from northern part and just uh, felt the difference when I started my career or the southern part of Montenegro. Uh, so it is, let's say, very interesting to say that it doesn't depend so much uh, on only on the family. It depends also on the, um, of the uh, culture, of the historical background, maybe, maybe of, of uh, some parts of our country. That is what I wanted to add to discussion. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, it was really um, interesting. And this crew uh, metaphor, I like a lot mm -hmm. because I think it's like a symbol of, you know, society. It's like smaller entity where we can observe what is going on. And what you mentioned uh, about uh, having maybe bigger uh, challenges with the uh, people that are closer, is also, yeah, we could also find um, a basis for this in theory. For example, uh, already uh, Sigmund Freud uh, mm -hmm. had a concept about uh, narcissism of small differences. And that's exactly what you were explaining uh, when he noticed that we, uh, of course, don't uh, struggle so much oh, how different are people like from another parts of the world, how impossible it is for us to coexist, but our neighbors, uh, these are our biggest struggle because they are so similar, but still not the same. And this similarity, but not sameness is bothering us in this interpersonal level somehow. Yeah, so it makes sense because probably uh, somebody from like who looks um, more distant, we wouldn't even let closer, like we wouldn't engage, we wouldn't be so emotional. It, it cannot touch us as something that is supposed to be close. Yes, also in our families, um, I read somewhere that uh, how people do on their spiritual development, so and so on and so on. And then uh, uh, one of the teachers said, go to your parents and you will see how spiritual you are. If you are okay with something that they say on the other side and you are not angry with them, okay, then you are spiritual enough. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's something interesting. Yeah. Yes, if you can be in Nirvana, but then you will come to your family and you will get <laughs> mad instantly. Yes, yes of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, if I um, uh, maybe return to uh, before uh, Tamara was, was sharing uh, why, why I asked which groups, because in Slovenia and probably also other parts, uh, we have research uh, sometimes. Uh, so uh, we are asked, uh, 
uh, who are the groups uh, we wouldn't like we have to rank who the, who you wouldn't like to have for your neighbor and then people rank and those are certain groups like uh, minority groups or also single parents or um, drug user a person from lgbt community roma migrant and so on uh, and I think that uh, drug users and uh, people from Roma community or refugees are uh, usually those that people wouldn't like to have for neighbors. Um, and another, maybe more anecdote, just to share briefly with you about this NIMBY effect. Again, uh, it's connected with Roma because we opened this issue and now it's somehow <laughs> here. Um, in a, a region, Dolenska region in Slovenia, uh, there are bigger Roma communities and uh, people that live around uh, are seen as maybe more, you know, explicitly expressing prejudice and sometimes they even force Roma community to leave. It happened in the past. For example, they simply had to leave because people from the village um, uh, yeah, didn't want to live with, with them. And then, uh, like, you know, academics from Ljubljana, now I'm talking, yeah, like, um, like, as we are seen, we are always clever, you know, oh, you are so hateful, you, you cannot live together. Um, and we had one comic, one actor, uh, and he did, um, years ago a uh, project that like he came to Ljubljana somehow to certain people uh, and say oh uh, this Roma family will now live here on your background uh, here in Ljubljana is it okay uh, we see that you have place they will just stay here for a while because they don't have any anywhere to stay and I think he was touching a little bit you know this attitude if we are far we can know what to do and we can tell other people how to do. And uh, if it will come to us, uh, near to us, to our backyard, then maybe we will be challenged it and it will be another story. Um, of course, it's, yeah, it's a little bit uh, stupid altogether. We cannot say, okay, if you if you are open or if you are talking about interculturality, then you will be open for anybody. Of course, it's not like this, it's not so simple. But still, it's interesting how then uh, they wanted to somehow show that maybe one thing is to uh, have an opinion when certain phenomena is really far from you. And uh, another thing is when it comes near to you. Uh, now I thought of um, one song. I'm not sure if you know it. Probably Abhishek will not know it because it's completely other part of, of the world. Damir Audic, maybe, I don't know if you know, he's a singer uh, from Bosnia originally, but he's living in Slovenia. And he's really, really interesting, uh, really interesting author, Kant author. Uh, and uh, in his songs, he usually, uh, I mean, he often discussed those topics. For example, I remember one when he said, oh, I care a lot about this Roman community, but this one in France that Sarkozy is one uh, trying to get rid because it was when it was Sarkozy's time, not those in my community. I don't want to see them, but I support those that live far from me. So it was also something uh, trying to show how it's maybe easy to support something which is far, but difficult to live with neighbor or with family, as Sinka said before. Okay, mm, uh, yeah, here, uh, uh, is there something else that, uh -huh, maybe there is something else, yes, that we could say about it, not a lot, just uh, another thing. Uh, even ignorance is considered as um, uh, this um, a contemporary form of prejudice. So not having opinion, uh, don't care actually, trying to avoid. 
uh, and it's probably something similar as Tamara, you said before on the beginning when we started to talk today, that you you just said, oh, oh okay, I'm equal. Uh, I, I have, I'm like respectful to everyone. I thought it was enough, but maybe I was just not thinking about differences. Um, and maybe just, yeah, don't consider or being ignorant or don't want to engage with it. Uh, Miriam Nole, for example, she mentions it's also a part of this uh, contemporary form of prejudice, uh, which are then um, difficult even to notice. They can exist and we don't even, we don't even actually notice because yes, their function is the status quo, that things will stay unchanged. Um, Okay, do you have maybe a question or a comment before we go on? I wanted just to say something from the... It's not academic, it's nothing, uh, but uh, how difficult it is uh, to live with somebody who is different than you. It's not only the point of the uh, other, uh, how to say, um, ethnic group or anything. We cannot live uh, with our parents. We cannot live uh, when we are adult with the... Uh, not uh, can, we cannot live. It's, uh, it's not... Uh, uh, we take just parts which we like to take from the other people, even in our family, isn't it? We all, all of us, we will... Uh, agree that it is natural when you got uh, 20 years, when you got uh, some uh, university degree, that you want to live uh, where you want with uh, somebody who want, and you uh, take your parents for granted, like, okay, they are here, but you don't think too much about elder people, or when you are in uh, uh, certain ages, like uh, mine, for example, uh, that your kids leave your house and uh, you take them for uh, just for that part, which is interesting. So it's not just a part of the, uh, it is the topic of this, but it is uh, in our nature, in people in nature, that we just take one part of the uh, other person. So it doesn't matter is it... Uh, is he uh, from uh, it's uh, from uh, it's the uh, wrong people or uh, is uh, he from the it's uh, just one small part of interest what we want or what is uh, interesting for us or something like that so uh, it's in people uh, nature to just take just one part i agree that we uh, institutionally have to support that every person had uh, equal rights and everything uh, and that is the i think the the main point and what i really like it for all this uh, it's uh, that uh, idea in slovenia when when uh, somebody want to assimilate in uh, your country you divide it from the uh, it's not maybe institution um, institutionalism, right? it's too difficult to say, but to divide them, uh, one person or one family or something like that, in your, uh, where you are minority. So in that case, if they want to assimilate, uh, because it, it, uh, the country is like home. If somebody come to my house, I want them to, uh, to make to follow my rules isn't it country is like that so i think that uh, I, I i cannot say it's too much uh, talk about that it's just uh, about uh, people uh, human being nature just to take a uh, uh, specific part of the other human being you know it doesn't matter is he uh, i don't know uh, black or white or something when I am 20, I want to leave my parents. I want to live where I want. I want to do what I want in my house. Uh, my parents, they are fed up of uh, me. They said, okay, just go away. So I think that that uh, multi multiculturalism, um, it's just one segment of the human being. So that is uh, my opinion. <laughs> 
Yes, uh, thank you, Tamara, for this observation. Uh, how we can, yeah, we can observe it really on different levels, and it's the same mechanism, of course. Yes, it doesn't change when it comes to another ethnicity. It's the same mechanism. Maybe uh, one more thing which make it a little bit more difficult, and we added today, is this topic of ideologies, of these broader ideologies that also work through this and can also be on work even in our families. For example, we can maybe have ideology of ageism, ageism, like, you know, having a certain prejudice towards older people or thinking they are not useful. And yes, it can come out through our interactions uh, in our private interactions on in maybe a professional, environment somewhere uh yes but i agree of course we can it's not that we could uh, get rid of it or say oh we can have to accept unconditionally probably it doesn't exist <laughs> we were uh, making um questionnaire with my colleague uh just a few days ago and there was a question uh do you have a person that um that accept you unconditionally and we were like, come on. And then this colleague said, maybe my dog, not even partner, not even kids, not even parents, unconditionally. No, children, not at all. Of course, we have conditions. Um, and yes, like you said, Tamara, it's very, very human. <laughs> um, okay. Um, uh, I um, had the idea that maybe after a break, we could... Uh, uh do uh, this activity so maybe i will try to to uh, say something more and we will see if it's too much then we make a break before but maybe just one more uh one more topic before break um because we are now on this train already and maybe it would be just additional additional view uh so um okay Again, uh, same <laughs> similar concepts, but a little bit specific focus I want to give here. Again, two concepts on the other, on one side, multiculturalism, and on the other side, interculturalism. Uh, I really uh, want to talk about this because it's also in the title and in the aim of our workshop. Uh, we have this term inter. And uh, here is a difference and a lot of literature also we can find about this in education and in higher education. Uh, when we would talk about multiculturalism, um, this, uh, this word multi would just say there are more cultures. Yes, of course, this is the reality of contemporary world or of any world ever. Yeah, there is no only one culture, but we have to live with others. And yes, there are different cultural gr groups living and sharing environment. But if we stay only with multi multiculturalism, uh, it doesn't need to be an uh, intense uh, relation between them. It just, we, ca we can just say, okay, we tolerate, like we said, we tolerate, uh, and it's a model of toleration. We know that they live somewhere, but maybe we prefer to have our own schools and our neighborhoods, and we wouldn't really like them to enter our university. Uh, and more contemporary um, uh, idea would be interculturalism, and this word inter, uh, is for um, interaction. Yesterday we were talking a lot about these interactions. So it's not only living together, but it's only entering in over interactions, exchange, uh, being in mutual relations. Mutual means in both ways, not only one way, but in both way. Mutually also recognize one another in cultural way, in linguistical way, like to recognize, to acknowledge. 
Um, so uh, with un interculturalism, we open this space in between. So we don't only exist like on islands, separate, we have to exist there, but we uh, communicate and there is this space between, which is important. And uh, we open this concept of relationality, odnosnost, something that has to do with relations. Um, uh, just a short example, uh, I was thinking about how in maybe years ago, uh, if I think of my own experience with um, exchange students, when things were only maybe 20 years ago, not so settled, we didn't have so many students, so many exchange students, and the organization was of course not so good for them. Uh, but my experience was, okay, one came, two came, or three of them came to my group, to my class, and um, they were part of the class with the languages uh, they spoke and the uh, ideas they had and knowledge and everything. And we somehow had to interact and somehow learned how to communicate. Uh, it was more difficult because it was just, okay, here I am, now I would like to be a part of your study, uh, what can we do? Uh, and um, we had, yes, a lot of those interactions, mutual learning, also difficulties, uh, how to adopt, uh, but at the end, um, we, yeah, we made a lot of relations, our student, students from Slovenia, uh, they uh, gained a lot of new knowledge, new experiences from this person. And I could say it was quite intercultural. Um, and with organization getting better, which is of course necessary and unavoidable, and it's good that it's like this, but from my experience in a way, also something is uh, we are losing because we have many students and we organized extra classes for uh, exchange students on our faculty, not everywhere. On our faculties, on other faculties in Slovenia it's, or in, in Ljubljana even, is different. But for example, they would have their model in English. Yes, uh, Slovenian students could attend, but not really often they would attend. So they would uh, have possibility to meet one another. And maybe they would even live in certain uh, student dormitory because it's more, it's easier if they are all in the same one. So they will live in one that is dedicated to foreign students and they won't have a lot of chance to, you know, to meet other people. For example, if this is organized like this, uh, if they would like we would want them to be like mixed as much as possible, scattered around, uh, we would, yeah, uh, we would say we, we um, appreciate uh, these uh, interactions. Uh, things are not so organized, are not so easy. Maybe in organizational manner, they are more difficult. But still, what we get at the end is um, maybe much more uh, interconnected experience for both parts. Uh, so yeah, there are many levels, for example, for me before, where when things were not so massive, um, my experiences were much stronger, and now they are massive and they are organized, and usually with organization better and with this um, massivity, when many students are coming, we lose probably some possibilities that we had on the beginning, or maybe it's our challenge uh, to think how to get also this uh, inter uh, place, uh, interspace back. Um, I wanted to ask you if maybe you, you have an uh, idea. Uh-huh, Radenka, yes, please. How is it? Yeah, again, I can I can just share my own experience uh, as uh, as a student and uh, I don't know, master student and then PhD students. Uh, I when I think I always been in this uh, 
multicultural uh, environment uh, uh, because for example the master was organized uh, to to uh, the master that i attended for example was specifically for the mediterranean countries so uh, we have people from the um, north african countries uh, uh, middle east and um, and uh, from uh, uh, our countries, you know, it was uh, so from Montenegro and uh, from Italy. So uh, it was a, a nice experience and we were, it was quite intensive one year uh, master course where um, we had to live together and we uh, we were all day together at the university and then we had our uh, little uh, um, houses, let's say, houses uh, attached to each other, so rooms, and um, um, yeah, it was maybe a strange experience for me because it was the first time away from home, so, uh, and I could distinguish uh, that that there are different um, uh, ways of, uh, of living, different, completely different cultures, no, and uh, but we all accepted this, this was the case also for Italians, you know, so uh, we were all there, Italians and the foreigners together. And um, um, what we could uh, see immediately that people, I don't know, from Palestine or from Morocco, they were more, they were together. Uh, so they had their own groups and they cooked together in the evening. They didn't want to go out uh, with us uh, to the town. Um, that was, I think, the, the major difference. But at, uh, uh, at the university, we were always together. We had fun. We, uh, so that, that was... Um, and then um, in, um, afterwards, for example, in Belgium, I... Had, we were about 50 people uh, in the lab and uh, we were really uh, from all around the world. And um, what I really liked there that we had uh, this uh, obligatory coffee breaks at uh, I don't know, 10, 15 for half an hour and then at three o'clock for half an hour uh, where, every, where you can meet everybody and talk. And uh, sometimes these meetings were half uh, uh, I'd say serious, scientific, and sometimes we're completely uh, just to, to have a coffee and a chat. But that was the way to meet everybody. And um, uh, but uh, what what was interesting that only after working hours, when we were alone, um, so foreigner PhD students um, had the proper interaction. Like we would stay late and. Uh, we will have a chance to have, I don't know, Chinese uh, dishes from our colleague from China, or he would bring, uh, I don't know, some, uh, or there was a Vietnamese girl that she prepared special cookies from rice because that's the day they celebrate the famous poet or something. So, so we would really um, learn a lot from them on these informal um, meetings we, we had. And um, um, so I think that was really a valuable experience. And uh, um, the other thing, Yes, you are right. When you have the dormitories, the student dormitories, when they are mixed, it's, it's uh, I think, the best. And I, I lived in Venice in, in such place, and it was really great. Um, there was no uh, mensa, no, uh, so we had to cook together. We had uh, facilities, and that was also the time when uh, uh, we could talk, share recipes, talk about uh, our cultures, and... Uh, and then go out together to the town. No? So that was a, a nice time. Mm -hmm. But I think really that uh, uh, maybe the, the teachers, the, the professors can't do much, but encourage them to uh, have these uh, uh, activities, extra uh, free time together. No? I think that's, uh, that's useful because I didn't notice that the, at universities that we had uh, some, uh, I don't know, encouragement to do things together, but we were doing it anyway. And I think it, because there were opportunities, if we live at the same place, it's, it comes naturally, I think. 
Yes, uh, thank you. But I think um, also uh, to emphasize uh, this uh, informal part, uh, yes, which of course happens, but it needs conditions um, uh, that it, it can take place. Yes, uh, we need uh, we need space, we, we need time, and probably we have to think about it. It, it cannot happen if there, there are no possibilities. Uh, on the beginning, yesterday, uh, I mentioned how I experienced this um, a lockdown uh, uh, period that, that we had now, one year, and of course, all, all the possibilities were closed. But we could still find some. For example, I was working here in faculty, and it was a time when I spent uh, so much time, more than ever before, for example, with certain foreign students, because they studied here. They didn't have their place uh, at home, they shared rooms, uh, and then, yeah, they, they were here. And it was a difficulty for them when the faculty was closed, for example, for, for a certain time, because they, they didn't know, oh, where, where will I write my thesis and so on. Um, so, yes, I think, oh, it's important also for me to, to maybe find a way uh, to tell that they need a place now and yeah and then we were actually just informally I was working and my colleague was working they were here we went for a coffee <laughs> if it was possible and it was um, yeah really really nice experience especially because uh, there was such a lack of other informal possibilities to just be together with other people. yeah just i want to say if there is a, a international uh, settings in a lab or at a, in a group of course uh, you can do this and uh, do things together have these coffee breaks together and talk and chat and maybe organize i don't know a trip together uh picnic i don't know we had this for example in antwerp that was that was uh, really good well organized but a part of that uh, it was, I don't know if I can call it institutional because it was just uh, uh, initiatives of, of our lab management or our um, supervisor, if you want, but uh, uh, to say so, I don't know if, if it's really guided by the uh, institution. In this case, it was not, but the institution was providing, you know, free courses of languages, etc. Et no, and uh, um, this there were actually also uh, they were organizing for uh, new coming international students some activities, uh, um, tours around the, the city, etc. So yes, the, the, this was this existed, but for me personally, it was more important to have this. Uh, um, lab uh, gatherings and uh, uh, after hours uh, chats and or, or yeah. talks. Mm -hmm. Of course, in this informal part, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so now we are speaking for two hours already. Uh, probably some of you are already a little bit tired. But yes, I want, of course, to, to open the questions what do we prefer, multicultural or, or intercultural, which is a little bit more in front now in the discussions, in professional discussions, and also, um, yeah, suggestions. And also, yeah, to, to ask, I think we already touched it, how to organize our activities to move from multi to interculturalism, if we see it beneficial. I think we already touched this. Okay, this is, again, maybe just for... Oh, just to show you, uh, uh, again, one insert from the news, maybe more, more, I couldn't say fun fact because it's not fun, but more on this level, uh, please take it, latest news. Uh, yesterday I noticed um, and I, I, yeah, I realized that it's actually, again, symptomatic, although it's a bigger story and it's all only, um, only something from the news that we don't know what is behind, but the news was that uh, construction workers from Turkey are coming to a really small village in Slovenia because they will build uh, some huge constructions there. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, Slovenia needs them because of, we don't have such construction um, companies, looks like. And one really interesting question that came out 
In media, one journalist said, a Turkish company assured that their uh, exits will be organized, so they will not move freely around. Uh, it was a, maybe just lapsus or maybe something that she didn't want to say, but I think it's interesting to share, maybe as an example. Okay, yes, we need them on one side, uh, a lot of them will come to construct, but please build a campus for them and uh, a guard and um, uh, what if they will move around? Of course, of course, it's, it, it's not going to be so easy and we have institutions that will now, of course, um, uh, like for workers, we have really good organization. I think it's um, like workers uh, consulting office, something like this, that will guard now what will be going on. And maybe it's just a lapsus, but still it may be interesting on this level of ideologies that comes out through this maybe simple, banal, in a way, um, statements that the journalists um, 